All right, I can see that people are coming in gradually, and I expect that we will be seeing more as the hour goes on. I want to start by welcoming uh, all of you here. Uh, welcome to another opportunity to be an informed voter. We thank you for being here and the candidates for making it possible. I want to start by recognizing the uh, Peninsula College of Associated Students, particularly Trina. Is she here? Trina, who is the president of the council. And David, who is the vice president. Are you here, David? He's out in the hall. Well, he'll be he'll be appearing with uh, anything you might need, like paper or pens or something. So, uh, thank you very much for co-sponsoring this with us. It's very important to have the youth involved in these endeavors. We also want to thank uh, Peninsula College. <laughs> We're also trying to want to thank Peninsula College for the use of the Little Theater. It's a wonderful venue to do forms like this in. Um, so uh, we're very pleased with that. And I had a chance to say that to Mr. Robbins when he dropped by to say hello to us. And it could go without saying, but I will say it anyway, that, um, that uh, we owe a lot to the League of Women Voters Voter Services Committee, who does a lot of hard work to put all of these forums on. So thank you very much. I'm Bertha Cooper, and I'm going to be your moderator this evening. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters. In two years, the League will celebrate its centennial, nearly 100 years ago. Yes. Nearly 100 years ago, the League formed following the successful campaign to win, to win women the right to vote. The founders of the League deemed that the League would be a nonpartisan organization whose purposes are to encourage local citizens to register to vote, to become informed voters, to vote, and to be involved at all levels of government. Voter turnout in 2017 and the primary 2000 election in Clallam County was less than 50%. The presidential election of 2016 had 80.5% registered voters voting. That's a lot better than less than 50%. But even at that, nearly 10,000 registered voters in Clallam County did not vote. We all have an equal voice, but only if we vote. In that spirit, in the spirit of the League, those of you who are here tonight or, and are eligible to vote but not registered to vote can do so by picking up a form at the League table. Forms are available to you to take to family and friends not registered to vote. The deadline for online or mail-in registration has passed, but you, we all have until October 29th to register in person at the county courthouse, the auditor's office. As a nonpartisan organization, the League does not support or oppose candidates, factions, or political parties. The views expressed here tonight are those of the candidates and not of the sponsors of this forum. Our role is to provide the opportunity for you to meet and hear the candidates and make an informed decision based on your criteria and what you want to see from the elected position. The League does, however, act in support of or in opposition to selected governmental issues which its members have studied. You can find more information about the League on the membership table in the lobby or going to our website, which is located, uh, which is listed on your agenda. We will be following the agenda you should have in your hands. Is there anyone who does not have an agenda who would like one? Raise your hand. Okay. 
Great. Before we start, a couple of matters. First, turn off all cell phones and devices that make noise. Note there are restrooms in the lobby outside of the theater. A word about video recording. We are being recorded. Uh, no non-league audio or video recording devices of any kind are permitted during this forum unless prior permission has been received. The league is recording this forum and the video will be posted on the league's website. Our forum tonight will be in two parts. The first panel will feature candidates from the Public Utility District number one, Commissioner District number three. The second panel will be the candidates for United States House of Representatives, District 6, Washington State. Each panel will follow the same basic outline, although the second panel is longer and allows more time for statements and questions. The candidates will make brief opening statements. Next, we'll take questions from the audience, and then the candidates will make their closing statements. We hope you will be thinking of the questions you want to ask the candidates now and as you listen to their opening statements. If you need a card to write on to get your thoughts together, hold up your hand and a lead member will provide one or a student will provide one. Does anybody want a card and a pencil? Here's, here's a couple down here. One. Everybody else? No. Oh, somebody in the back row. Two people in the back row. Thank you. To make the most of your time, I ask you to kindly refrain, refrain from applauding or making any noises which in any way would interrupt our speakers. I'll be sure to give you a chance at the end of each panel to give a round of applause to the candidates. Student league members are wearing name tags. Uh, they're around the room. If you need any assistance, just signal them. Our timers this evening are Joan Coda and Walt Johnson. They are sitting in the front row and their job is very important. It is to make sure we stay within the time limits that have been established for each segment of our forum. Your agenda provides summary information on the responsibilities of each office that is being discussed here tonight so I am not going to take time to go over that with you. I'm going to move to the table. Okay. Uh, the candidates for the position of for public utility district number one, commissioner district number three, are Ted Simpson and Jim Waddell. Both candidates, in the order they file for office, will be given up to two minutes for their opening remarks. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. What are your qualifications for serving in this office? Why are you running for this office? And what are your goals for your first year in the office? Candidates, please keep your eye on our timer so you can gauge your time. If you see a stop sign, those folks down there, if they hold up a stop sign, uh, you may finish your sentence, but then stop. We'll begin with Ted Simpson. Well, well, good evening. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, get the right spot on this microphone. Uh, I'm a native of Clallam County. I was born here. Uh, went through the Fort Angeles school system. Uh, attended the very first uh, class of Peninsula College in 1961. That campus was over at the high school at that time. We didn't have as you know, beautiful facility that, that's here now. I attended Peninsula for two years and, and then went on down to uh, 
Olympic Junior College of Bremerton uh, to continue a study in forestry. Uh, while I was there, I changed my mind, uh, came back to Port Angeles, took out an electrical apprenticeship, went to work with my father, and became an electrician. And I have been one ever since. Uh, my, my interest in the PUD started in 1984 when five nuclear power plants were being uh, attempted to be constructed. Uh, only one of those was finished and put in operation. But through that process, our rates doubled from two cents to four cents. And that stirred the Northwest, not just Washington State, but the whole Northwest up pretty good. Uh, and so I ran for, for the office of PUD commissioner back in 1984, was elected, and I've been there ever since. Uh, I, I, yeah, hope to be able to continue to steer the PUD uh, in the direction of new green resources. And uh, yeah, that, that, that would be my goal for the next six years. Thank you. Jim Waddell. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here to talk to you folks. Um, I'm a civil engineer, a 35-year public service career uh, uh, civil engineer with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, had a lot of different jobs in the Corps from building stuff on the ground to being doing policy work in uh, the White House and Corps of Engineers and so forth, and even worked on climate change issues. Um, uh, one of the great jobs I had in the Corps was uh, in Walla Walla managing seven major hydro projects. And my job as a senior civilian in that district of 700 people was to um, sort of justify, well, estimate, justify, and try to receive, get funds for operating hydropower projects. So in the course of trying to do that kind of thing, you learn a lot about what hydropower actually costs. And, and that, was, uh, that was my job. It was to figure that out and justify those budgets to Congress. Um, so one of the, along the way, though, we were doing some studies about the cost of dams in the system, and we were noticing that it was, some of these dams were very expensive to operate. Um, so when I retired a few years ago, I got back into this uh, just on a chance whim, and um, actually right here at the Peninsula College, an event and got to studying hydropower again, particularly in face of Bonneville Powers Administration's uh, you know, cost challenges. Bonneville Power is basically facing a physical crisis today, and has been uh, for about seven or eight years since the amount of uh, surplus power they've been selling has been selling at a loss, which is why our rates are going up. And so the other thing I looked at, well, what is our PUD doing about this? And um, I went to a few meetings to brief the commissioners and so forth and told them what I thought my findings were about the cost of hydropower and that it was expensive. And we had some dams that were really good producers of hydropower. And there's other dams that weren't and cost a lot of money. So what I was trying to point out is how we move money around to, uh, from one dam to another and tried to bring this up to the attention. Thank you, candidates. Next, we'll take questions from you, the audience. Uh, please come to the microphone with your question and state your name and specify who your question is for. You will have up to 30 seconds to ask your question. Our timers will hold up the stop sign if you use up that time. A league member will hold the microphone for you. Resist trying to hold the mic. It won't work. You'll lose. <laughs> the candidates will have up to one minute to answer each question, so please consider this time limit when crafting your question. It may help you to stay within your 30 second time limit if you write your question beforehand and then read it when it's your turn at the mic. If you do not wish to come to the mic, give your written question with your name on it to one of our members or the student, and it will be read aloud by a league member or a student for you. The candidates will be given up to one minute to answer each question. 
Both candidates will have the opportunity to respond to all questions, even those directed to a specific candidate. I will then give each candidate the opportunity to respond to or rebut their fellow candidates' answers. They will be given up to 30 seconds for a brief response or rebuttal, or if they wish, they may waive their chance to respond. I expect there to be about 30 minutes for audience questions and candidate responses. Um, uh, if we run out of time before you get your question answered, uh, unfortunately, both our candidates have to leave on time. Is that, did I get that right? They have another, another form to go in the near Bay and don't have a lot of time to get there. So, so trying to get all your questions in during this time because I know they're here to, here to answer your questions and your concerns. Carol Hall and Marcia McGuire are our mic holders today. Um, and while you're, I see someone has lined up and the rest of you as you're coming forward to line up, uh, I'm gonna begin this part of the forum with the first question. And this is for both candidates. My question relates to earth warming, our climate change and energy resources. In your view, what is a public utility district's responsibility, if any, in managing current energy resources and identifying new energy resources in relation to climate change? We'll start with Ted Simpson. Yeah. Um, currently, the Clown County DOD purchases all its energy through Bonneville. Ninety-eight percent of that energy is green. Uh, and, and when I say that, that uh, includes uh, hydro, uh, which is about 88 percent of it. Uh, and hydro is not considered green under Initiative I-937. Uh, however, nuclear is, and that's 10 percent of it. Our, our challenge uh, right now is integrating the remaining green energy, wind, solar, and uh, geothermal uh, in, into that mix and keeping it low enough. We're not the bad guys, not in the Northwest. We, we really have one of the most carbon-free uh, energy uh, systems uh, in the world. Uh, where most of our carbon comes from is automobile. Jim? Um, I think it's, uh, uh, the, the PUD's role here is to really pursue um, any form of energy that can reduce rates. And right now, but wind and solar are very competitive with um, hydropower. Not all dams, but some hydropower. And so what I would pursue, not only for the benefits of green energy, um, but also for the fact that reservoirs emit methane, and methane is 85% more potent than carbon. So actually our dams aren't carbon, they're, they're carbon free, but not methane free. So pursuing um, green energy actually saves us money because right now uh, that, that power is coming in at 22 to $25 a megawatt hour and Bonneville and the PUD are charging us basically $36 a megawatt hour. So not only do we get green energy and integrate it pretty quickly because all you have to do is take off some of the surplus hydro power and let the grid accept more uh, solar and wind and there's already a lot of it, but that's what will happen. Ted, you wish to respond? You have 30 seconds. Uh, no, no, I, I think we're headed in the right direction the way we're going right now. Uh, further comments, Jim? Um, well, I think the PUD at a regional, like with inside the, uh, the county here, really ought to be incentivizing um, uh, solar especially and, um, and using that to create uh, smart grid areas, uh, microgrids and stuff like that to build some resilience into the community as well. So that's another aspect of, of green energy is it actually gives you a, a resource that can save you money in the short term but also be around in case we have power outages or other disasters. 
All right, we'll start now with questions from the audience. Uh, remember to state your name and to whom you want to direct your question. Uh, my name is Sandy Goodwick, and this would be for um, both of them. Okay. Uh, I'm fairly new to the area and did not um, have any say in uh, utilities work, you know, in Southern California, so I'm curious about why it's even an elected position. And so my question would be, what kind of decisions um, are routinely expected of, of uh, anyone in this position? And how would you be uniquely suited or qualified to um, answer those? What kind of things have been going on this past year? Let's start with Jim. Okay, um, well obviously one thing is that the PUD commissioner set policy and so forth, but this reminds me of something that's in the 1940 charter language of our PUD, and there's two points that are really critical. Our PUD was set up to reduce rates and to compel electricity providers to reduce their rates as well for what we pay. And so what I think one of the, another function for the PUD commissioners is to actually work with other PUD commissioners around the, the state and, and uh, actually I've done this as late as uh, last Thursday working with the Cowlitz County PUD to get up there and exhibit, um, demonstrate some leadership in the face of Bonneville Power Administration. Bonneville Power is just handing us bills and our PUDs, including this one, are just accepting those rate increases without, without too much of an argument, it appears to me. So that's part of the problem is to demonstrate leadership. Ted? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I really didn't understand the question or couldn't hear it. Uh, could you? The, qu the question was, uh, what, what are the responsibilities of the commissioners and what kind of things do you work on? Yes, what decisions like this past couple of years and how are unique, you uniquely qualified to um, respond to them? Okay. Uh, yeah, P P Commissioner is the conduit between the public and uh, the PD. And it's your job to listen. People like you or anybody else that wants to talk to you or will talk to you about what they perceive to be a problem. Uh, and then bring that back to the, the, the PD management and See if you can't rectify that. Uh, I've done that for the last 35 years, uh, 34 years, excuse me, uh, and uh, I think have done it very well. Uh, we do take care of the needs of the community, in, in my opinion, anyways. And I, and I think that's uh, the, the biggest part of the job for a PD commissioner. Your time is up. Thank you. Um, did you want to respond? Sure. Um, let me, you asked a bit about qualifications. Uh, one of the things I've done is, uh, last, since I retired about 10 years ago, is spent about 10,000 hours of my own time boring into this issue about uh, what BP, BPA is doing to us. And, and uh, like I mentioned, leadership is important here. And getting in the face of these federal agencies is what we really need to be doing. And that's what I've spent a lot of my time over the last five or six years doing on my own. So um, that's one of the qualifications I, I bring to this, is just simply taking leadership positions with federal agencies that don't like to be listened, listened to. Ted, do you wish to respond? I, no, not really. Okay. A question here? So Ed Bowen, and my question is to both of you, basically a vision question. I'm looking for your vision. With the premise that broadband is or will be a utility, what is your vision on how it could be rolled out in the rural areas of this peninsula, similar to the idea that we had several generations ago called rural electrification? Let's start with Ted. Yeah, and uh, we, the PUDs, uh, all over the state of Washington have uh, been negotiating, if you will, with the legislature to have authority to do that. Uh, currently, we don't have that authority. 
We, we, we here at Clown County do power, water, and sewer. Uh, and so, so that's something, we also belong to an outfit called NoNet, uh, who brings you know, fiber and internet into the community for us. We also use fiber to connect our substations for our SCADA system, and we overbuilt that and make it available to local ISPs. Ted? Um, my vision is, um, I, I, as I see it in the future, what I really see is an empowered citizenry in the rural areas that are able to access the, the best technology and, and internet technology and information in order to give them, um, increase their ability to earn money and be connected and, and stay educated. And I think this is a, you know, kind of a foundation thing for our well-being in terms of economic development and sustainable development in terms of the economy is to have um, people that are in these, this time and age, you have to be connected. And when you are, you can actually be quite effective in terms of um, creating wealth uh, in parts of the rural areas that right now do not have, have much wealth because of their disconnectedness. Ted, you wish to respond or rebut? Well, just one additional thing. Uh, you know, you, the, the general public, uh, have been putting pressure on the, uh, not just Clown County PD, but all utilities to bury uh, our lines, get them on site. Uh, and we've done that. And about 60% of our distribution system is underground. We don't have any poles uh, or any place to string fiber. It becomes much more difficult to re-ditch or dig ditches and distribute that stuff. Ted? I'm sorry. Jim? Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> oh, you're done. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, question here. Uh, my, name's, my name is Lisa Bulwer. I'm unfamiliar with the role of the PUD, and can you each talk about your top priorities for Clallam County if you are elected? Is it to both candidates? Thank you. Okay, then we will start with, with Jim. Okay, I think uh, my top priority would be this. Um, since uh, the what we pay Bonneville for um, our power is basically 60% of your power bill. So it, and, and those, that, those rates are going up because of Bonneville's financial crisis. And they got a lot of debt to pay back and if they were trying to pay, if they tried to seriously pay it back, we'd hit double digit rates. So it's gonna take some serious cost cutting within the Bonneville Power Administration to keep our rates from going up. And they should, we should be being able to get them down because of what I mentioned before is that uh, a lot of green energy is now priced lower than Bonneville. So that would be my top priority. And I realize there's things to do within the county, you know, upgrading lines and so forth like this. But if we can't control that 60% of the cost, then we're not going to have the kind of money it's going to take to build the, maintain the systems within the county and upgrade them and, and everything else we need to do in terms of paying people and employees in the county that work for the PUD. Ted? Yeah, I, I'm gonna kind of deviate from uh, that answer. And, and uh, you know, Clown County PUD, along with all other PUDs, are what we call public power. Uh, and when we say public power, it means that it's you. They operate not for profit. Uh, and, and so, all our costs are pooled, and from that pool, we generate a rate. Uh, for those people who don't, can't pay their bill, uh, you pick up that slot. Jim, you wish to respond? Um, well, I just want to say one other thing is that about Bonneville Power. Um, it's important to recognize that Bonneville Power is a marketing agency for hydropower. That's the one of their two functions. The other one is maintaining the grid. As a marketing agency, they do everything they possibly can to push hydropower no matter what it costs at us. And so that's why I think that getting ahead of them and getting into them and trying to control those rates, and that's part of our charter, is to compel those electric companies to reduce their rates. Ted? <clears throat> yeah, they also uh, follow our load. So when 
you turn on the light, one will make sure that the power is there for it. Uh, and, and that's a very, very, very complicated uh, system that uh, Bonneville operates. Uh, you know, Jim's been critical of Bonneville. They do a heck of a job. Their costs are uh, astronomical, but uh, that's part of part of the cost of doing business. Okay. We have another question here. My name's Cheyenne. Uh, my question's for Jim. I just moved here, so it might just be educating me, but you talked about a vision for wind and solar. Where I moved, there were wind and solar farms. So if um, if, you, if we did want to move in the direction, are, would we be talking about building those farms? Where would the nearest farms be? Like, where, how would we get some of that wind and solar power? Okay. Jim. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's two, two uh, geographic answers to this. First is locally. Um, solar should be um, incentivized much, much uh, more effectively than it has been right now with the PUD. That builds that resiliency I talked about earlier, and it saves money. Um, the second one, though, is that in the state of Washington, there's a lot of growth potential for more wind. Eastern Washington can support a lot of wind. They have 7,000 megawatts now. And, um, and the other th cool thing about Eastern Washington, it's a perfect place for solar because it's perfectly matched with the kind of temperatures in the summertime and peak demands. And when that solar, and there's now 5,000 megawatts of solar waiting to be put on Bonneville's grid, and there just simply isn't enough room because of the hydropower, which is actually costing more. So the, the, you, know, you have a, that answer out in the state, which will reduce our rates and carbon footprint, methane footprint, as well as um, what we do here locally is to get more solar in our communities here. Ted. Yeah, uh, oddly enough, Clown County PUD uh, has over 300 solar generators on its system right now. There's only one other PUD in the state that has more, uh, and it's not much. We, we really have uh, had a good response we attempted to build a solar farm uh, in the swim area, and it failed. Jim, you wish to respond? Yeah, just a, a quick one there about the you know solar in the um, this county here. I'm a solar owner, um, and I can tell you that it was really tough, you know, breaking through all the rules and stuff to get it here. And I know a lot of other people that have been trying to s install solar have run into similar frustrations with the PUD. And the in the utility scale that uh, Ted just talked about, I think that's a case where the PUD just was not uh, exercising enough leadership and initiative to help really gain momentum on that and go and, and make that work. Ted, you wish to rebut? I, no, we're, we're, we're just uh, trying to accommodate uh, wherever we can. Uh, people would like to do that. Uh, again, this is a system, and you don't want individual uh, putting power into your system when you don't need it. I, I, Jim talks about some uh, restraints. But those are cautions uh, to make it safe for the system for us to work on. Our next question will be over here. With my, my name is John Conrath, and my I have a question about transparency for TED, or really lack of transparency, with the way the ICPUD interacting with our ratepayers. I've gone to your meetings, and it seems like there's an appalling lack of discussion. People get up and they say their piece, and there's no discussion on the part of the commissioners. Uh, I've uh, gone to meetings that weren't taking place, and there was never any notice that, that it wasn't taking place. You know, that's a type of non-transparency. Okay, and then, your question, uh, you're, the you're out of time. I'm out, out of time. So it's mainly about okay. transparency. Well, also, uh, uh, for example, net metering was never put on to the agenda, which is a major uh, uh, issue. All right. Ted, the question was directed toward you. Well, I guess I'm uh, a little bit uh, confused uh, of all the 
county agencies. I think the PUD is one of the most transparent. Uh, uh, we, we certainly don't discuss things outside of our meeting uh, amongst the commission. Uh, we, we have to operate under state guidelines, state and federal guidelines, and, and sometimes those uh, influence our, our decisions or our direction. Uh, but I, I would say that we're very transparent. Jim? Well, I, I experienced your uh, sort of uh, interaction with the commissioners myself in terms of them not listening to me pointing out the, the significant problems with uh, Bonneville's uh, cost. Um, and that's why I'm running, was because I said, no, okay, that's enough, I'm going to run. Uh, one other thing about transparency, though, it's interesting when you go to the website for the PUD, they have failed to post their financial statement for the last three years. That is a real bust in transparency, and we can't even see the financial statements, which should be posted within a month or two of each physical year, and there's nothing there for the last three years. Ted. Uh, all I can say is that the commission is not responsible for posting uh, any information on, on the utilities website. That, that's a staff function, and uh, if we're not doing something that's uh, required by law, I certainly have an opportunity to come to a meeting and, and let us know that and see that it gets changed. Jim? Uh, we shouldn't have to rely on staff. If something's wrong, Commissioner ought to jump right in and, and take care of it. That's, uh, to me, just uh, lack of leadership. Okay. All right. Lisa, oh, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, all right, we'll go with you until Lisa's already had a turn. My name is David Harvey. Sorry to cut you off there. Uh, my question is for both candidates. Um, are you in favor of moving the PUD in a direction that would eliminate our need to purchase hydropower? As Jim mentioned, dams make reservoirs, and reservoirs contribute to methane production and global warming. However, they also have severe negative impacts on our local watersheds. What will you do to protect our watersheds and keep electricity affordable? This is for both candidates. Uh, then we'll start with Jim. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the hydropower, um, there uh, we, we need. We're going to need a lot of hydropower still for a long time. And, and yeah, a lot of that hydropower has really negative effects on salmon and so forth. Um, but we do know that there are some hydro projects that are wasting money and killing salmon. And those um, that have been well documented. I'm personally familiar with those and know how much what the problems are, and so those should be decommissioned immediately. Um, and that's one way to get um, not only our rates down, but to protect the environment in a very profound way, because uh, as I speak, we are about to lose the, the, the salmon runs of the Pacific Northwest um, and the orcas that go along and, and depend on those Chinook. Ted? Yeah, I, I, I differ in that we are going to be successful in changing our mode of transportation from hydrocarbons, gasoline and diesel, to electricity. We're going to need all the generation that we have right now and then some. Uh, and I don't think this is the time to be taking dams out and then have to replace them in order to, to operate our electric vehicles. Jim. Um, the Northwest Power and Planning Council has uh, published this as a seven-year plan, and they're late, for, for many years they've been saying we're going to have um, uh, basically increases in demand. They have now found and finally admitted that through conservation and other meth, meth in, in, in incorporation of green energy, we're now saying that the, there is no, will be no demand increases in the Pacific Northwest for the next 15 years. And so we're in a great position to integrate these renewables right now without any impact and will be good for, for a decade or two to come. Ted, you wish to respond or rebut? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, when, uh, no increase. That's a whole lot of conversation or conservation. And we have done very, very well with our conservation efforts. Uh, that's what brought us out of the whoops uh, debacle that we had was conservation. Uh, but again, if we are going to change from hydrocarbons to electricity to operate our motor vehicle fleets, we're going to need all the generation we have right now and then some. Okay. Uh, 
Elisa, it looks like you can go next. got an answer to my question about your priorities for Clallam County if you're elected from Jim, but I didn't hear that from Ted. So I'd like to know from Ted what your priorities for Clallam County will be if you're elected to the PD, re-elected. All right, Ted, it's your question. Okay, uh, our infrastructure, say, uh, if we're going to change from gasoline diesel to electricity to run our fleets, we're going we're gonna to need to increase the size of our distribution system. If we're going to use solar energy to boost or bolster our system, we're going to need to modify it to accept it. Jim? Um, um, you know, the, the calculus on this, the mathematics about how much you really need to increase the system to bring in electrical vehicles, I think is what Ted's talking about. Um, hasn't I haven't seen the numbers on it uh, I know I don't think this is significant infrastructure increases to introduce um, electric vehicles and the power planning council has already cranked that into their equations about how much uh, future demand is going to be needed they're cranked in electrical vehicles so we know from a statewide standpoint that's not really a, an issue Ted you wish to respond add to yeah I don't think anybody knows uh, what the impact is going to be exactly and when. Uh, how fast this is going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight, only that. But it is going to happen. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, it's all just a bunch of guesswork. Uh, nobody's got any hard fact numbers to know what we, the public, are going to do as far as accepting uh, that, that, that type of a change. Jim? Well, I think it still uh, serves us well to go ahead and, and, like you said, it may take a while. And so let's get started on it. We can gradually increase. And that's one thing about introducing technology like this at a phase, kind of, you know, let's get rolling now instead of waiting until some edict comes along and all of a sudden you've got, you know, thousands of electric cars to deal with. We've got the chance now to do this smart and get moving. And so we ought to do it and we ought to um, just take, take the initiative. We will take one more question. Mike Tetro, um, just want to hear your thoughts on the carbon fee initiative that's coming up, 1631, this, I believe, for both candidates. On 1631, is yeah. that what you, okay. Yes. Uh, thoughts on 1631, and we will start with Jim. Um, I get the, you know, there's a lot of carbon initiatives going around. They all have the different, you know, aspects to them and so forth. And I think that um, uh, on the surface of it, we certainly need to um, support any kind of effort. None of them are perfect, and, and so we just need to go ahead and, and let's just get started on some of these things and work the bugs out as they go along. Um, on the other hand, though, I think a PUD can go way beyond what's being handed to us in these kind of fee initiatives and so forth like that and get after this situation of uh, reducing rates and um, in, in integrating green technologies and solar and wind and stuff like that uh, on our own. There's no wall holding, holding us back on this stuff, um, but we're waiting on the, the government to kind of tell us what to do or not to do. I, I think that's being a little bit reactive. I think this is where you can really demonstrate, you know, some leadership and get out there and, and, and make a difference with these technologies as opposed to being on the receiving end of whatever comes down at some point in time. Ted? Yeah, the uh, beauty, I'm kind of beauty commission signed a resolution a couple weeks ago that opposes uh, that initiative. Uh, it, it, it's not that we're opposed to trying to decrease carbon. We, we, we support that in every way. It's, it's how they wanted to use the funds, how they uh, evaded how they wanted to use the funds. That gets put into a, a commission of 15 people that the governor appoints and they kind of decide how to spend that money. Support. Jim? Um, well, let's put things in perspective. This, uh, this bill, if it's passed, will have a fee to um, oil producers and so forth like that. That fee could get passed on. 
Um, the PUD is estimated something like twenty or thirty thousand uh, dollar expense to the PUD for additional fuel charges in two or three uh, in two years. Let's put that in perspective. Our PUD has about a seventeen or, or eighteen million dollar reserve right now, so I don't think it's going to kill us to to spend twenty thirty thousand dollars on that um, with some possibly some additional fuel surcharges if they're passed down in the first place. Ken. Uh, yeah, it's not so much the fuel charges, it's all the other uh, unknown uh, mandates that were in that legislation. Uh, we need to form a plan uh, and renew that plan every two years and, and uh, present that to this commission of 15 uh, member commission, have it approved. We would need to hire people, uh, additional people, just and administer that plan uh, and uh, we didn't see the value of that thank you candidates you have given us a lot to consider uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Clallam County and the Peninsula College Associated Student Council uh, thanks for coming here and doing that with us let's give a round of applause We will have a break and reconvene at 5 p.m. During the break, you may want to pick up the summaries of the four initiatives on the ballot provided by the League of Women Voters of Washington. Copies are available in the lobby on the table. Sorry? Did I miss closing? That was closing. No. Oh, goodness sakes. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a terrible mistake. Oh, <laughs> Almost got out the door. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Lisa, for do, or thank you, Marcia, for doing that. Rusty at this. All right, well, let's do it. Okay. You up for it? Sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. We will provide closing statements in the order, uh, reverse order of the opening statements, and start with Jim Waddell. You have two minutes. Okay. And you get them all. All right. I'll try to use them up. Okay. So. You know, I've been a public service a servant all my life, um, and I guess I still am come spending a lot of my free time trying to figure out how to resolve some pretty complex government issues in terms of hydropower, renewables, uh, the environment, stuff like that. Um, and and I, that's what, um, you know, when people ask me about this position, and I realized that I did have a lot of qualifications to um, pursue it, and, and given my passion of serving the public and, and, and also have a great passion as a physical conservative, and I did this in government, was to constantly seek ways to reduce the cost of services, uh, you know, how our money was being spent in government, and manage to save a lot of many, many million, millions of dollars in terms of uh, cost savings and time initiatives. So um, that's what I want to bring to the PUD. I honestly believe that we can reduce rates instead of just simply accepting the rate increases we're getting from Bonneville Power, but you can't do that by yourself. You've got to work with other PUDs. You've got to exhibit some leadership. And that's, that's what I was doing last week with the, uh, the PUD, Callitz, the Callitz PUD manager was talking about how we, how we organize ourselves to um, reduce rates. And I'm doing that now. And so um, I'm just going to carry on if elected and kind of keep pursuing that and keep building on the work that we've already done. Ted, your closing statement. I, I, I'm going to stay a little bit closer to home. Uh, we, we do work with the Washington State Beauty Association collectively to try and pass legislation uh, and influence decisions at the congressional level. But there's a lot of things to do here at home. Uh, like I've said earlier, uh, I think we need to look at our infrastructure real, real carefully. We need to pay attention uh, to how we put the load on it. It's changing, uh, and we're changing how the system, the system itself, is being used. And just try and keep in mind that it is a system, and if you poke a hole in it someplace, it affects a lot of people down downstream from where that was uh, and, and that needs to be uh, shored up uh, a lot of our system is aging uh, it's over 50 60 years old we've got holes that we inspect all the time uh, to try and keep them from falling over we've replaced a lot with fiberglass uh, 
And I'd just like to continue to take care of our local system. It's five o'clock, so we are going to start. Um, we'll start by welcoming these candidates, uh, Derek Kilmer and Douglas Deitman, who are making it possible for us to, for us to become informed voters, at least around their race. Thank you so much for agreeing to appear. I want you to know, too, it's not just the League of Women Voters who are sponsoring this. It's also sponsored by Peninsula College Associated Student Council. And they've been helping out. They're back there. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome back. Um, we're going to follow the same format that we did during the first forum. And that is we will start with opening statements then do audience questions with answers and time for rebuttals and responses and closing statements. I'll remind you that a brief description of the responsibilities of the office are on your agenda. Uh, is, does everyone now have an agenda and a card if they need it to put their thoughts down and write their questions? If anybody doesn't, we need a couple down here. All right, keep your hand up and you will receive them in a second. The candidates for representative to the House of Representatives are Derek Kilmer and Douglas Deitman. Both candidates, in the order they file for office, will be given up to four minutes to make an opening remarks, opening statements. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. What are your qualifications for serving as United States Representative for our district? Why are you running for this office? And what are your goals for your term of office? Our timers are in the front row, Joan Cotta and Walt Johnson uh, please keep your eye on the timer so you can gauge your time. When you see a stop sign, you finish your sentence and stop. We'll begin with the first opening statement by Derek Kilmer. Thanks, everybody. I want to start by thanking the sponsors this evening, the League and the students. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank Doug for being here, too, and for putting himself out here as well. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to be home. I grew up here and growing up in Port Angeles absolutely shaped my values and it shaped uh, my life. Growing up in Port Angeles, I uh, saw what happened when the economy took a turn for the worse. And uh, that motivated me to go to college and to study public policy and focus on economic development. It's why I worked professionally in economic development for a decade, helping small businesses grow jobs in our region. And I brought that experience with me to our nation's capital as your representative. And it meant that when the Small Business Development Center here on the peninsula was slated for closure, I fought for it because I understand that small businesses are the backbone of our community's economy. It's part of the reason that I work to form the Olympic Forest Collaborative to work on increasing the harvest levels on our federal forests in a responsible way. Um, growing up here, I saw the importance of Olympic Medical Center, which is where I was born. Uh, and it's obviously a key employer here and a key provider of health services. And seeing that and understanding that is part of the reason that I've been such a strong advocate for rural health care. That means working to protect the parts of our system that work and working to fix the parts of our system that need fixing. Some of you may remember my grandma who lived here. Uh, my grandma's now 108 years old. I hope I have those genes. Uh, but 
Her ability to live with dignity has been tied to two of the most successful public policies in the history of this nation, Medicare and Social Security. That's not just true for her, that's true for a lot of people in this community and on the peninsula. And that's part of the reason that I've worked so hard and will continue to work to protect those programs and protect the ability of seniors to retire with dignity. Growing up here, I saw the importance of strong schools. My dad taught at Roosevelt, my mom taught at Monroe. Uh, I was Port Angeles High, class of 1992, and I've always been a strong proponent of our public schools. I also know how much this community did for me and for other Rough Riders to help those of us who wanted to go to college to be able to afford college. I look at education as the door to economic opportunity, and for a lot of families, uh, that door is locked right now. That's part of the reason that I've worked and will continue to work on ensuring that there's more access to affordable education for middle class families and working to reduce student debt. Uh, growing up here, I gained an appreciation for our natural resources, not just as drivers of our, our economy, uh, but as part of who we are. Um, that's part of the reason that I've worked on addressing the maintenance backlog in our national park system. It's part of the reason that I've worked so hard to get British Columbia to clean up its raw sewage and not uh, put that into our shared waters. Growing up here, I gained gratitude for our military families and for our, our military veterans, and that's part of the reason I've worked so hard to support our transitioning veterans and to ensure we fix some of the problems within the Veterans Administration. Now finally, growing up here, I learned the value of leading by example and of working together to solve problems. Listen, our region feels it when Congress doesn't do its job and pass a budget. And that's why I've stood up and, and sponsored a bill that's a bit controversial in our nation's capital. It's called No Budget, No Pay. It says if members of Congress don't do their job and pass a budget, they shouldn't get paid. I haven't had a job since I was a teenager working in this town at Westside Video where I got paid for a job that didn't get done. I also have worked to reform our campaign finance system because there's too much money in our politics. I've also co-chaired the bipartisan working group so that we can dial down the partisan bickering and start working to solve problems again. That's why I'm here. I'm not done working on your behalf, and I'm here to ask for your vote. Douglas Deitman. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Doug Deitman. I am a family physician in Shelton, Washington. I, I'm as qualified to do this job as most of the people actually that are sitting in this hall today, concerned citizens that have opinions, that they're willing to share their opinions with other people, and go represent people. My biggest concern about our um, system in Washington, D.C. is that we don't get represented as people. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do is go send an example. The reason I'm running today, and the reason I started doing this about six months ago, is because I looked around and I didn't see anybody, honestly, that was going to run as a Republican in the district. And I thought that was really a shame, because everybody should have the ability to hear what somebody says and make decisions and who they want to vote for and have options. So that was my first role. The second thing I realized was that when my son recently turned 18 and then 19, that he got to adopt $176,000 of federal debt. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in our society is the $21 trillion of debt that we have as a federal government. And we're not addressing that. And I think that we need to do that before we pass that on to our kids. I don't think that's fair. I mean, our, our country was founded because in part due to taxation without representation, and we're doing that to our children and our grandchildren every single day. My goals when I get back there are, are pretty simple. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to change the world in a single two years or four years. My goal is to go and set an example. My goal is to go and represent the people of the CIS district faithfully doing what I told them I was going to do, uh, not listen explicitly to what a party tells me I have to do, not listen explicitly to what people who donated to my campaigns tell me I have to do, but rather just to represent the people. And I want everybody here to know what my opinions are so that if they match what you're thinking, then that's what you would choose to do. I don't want to have any surprises. I, I want to just have all the questions I can get so you guys know exactly what I think. Um, I've been around this part of the world most of my life. I was a physician out of Forks for just under three years. Um, now I'm practicing down in Shelton. 
and I look forward to representing the people of the 6th District, given the opportunity, if you feel like I'm the right person for you. And so I hope you have lots of questions and we can share with you, you know, what our opinions are and go from there. Thank you, candidates. Now we'll take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. We will follow the same procedures as with the previous panel. Please come to the mic. State your name and specify whom your question is for. You will have up to 30 seconds to ask your question. A reminder, don't try to take the mic, you'll lose. The candidates will be given up to two minutes to answer each question. Both candidates will have an opportunity to respond to all questions, even those directed to a specific candidate. I will then give both candidates the opportunity to respond to or rebut their fo fellow candidates' answers. They will be given up to one minute to respond or rebut. If they wish, they may waive the chance to respond or rebut. I hope that we'll be able to hear all of your questions. Uh, please keep in mind that we'll uh, give everyone in the audience the chance to ask a question before taking follow-ups or multiple questions from the same person. If you prefer not to come to the mic, please give your written question with your name on it to a league member or a student to read at the mic. While you are oh, good, all right. While you are coming to the mic and lining up, I'm still going to ask the first question. Uh, this is for both candidates. According to the polls, access to affordable health care is frequently the number one concern of the American people. My question to you relates to the rising cost of health care insurance to people who pay privately and to businesses who provide total or partial premium support to employees as a health benefit. The question, what do you think the federal government can do more or do less to make health care more affordable and accessible to individuals who play, pay privately and businesses who provide health care as an employee benefit? And we will start with Derek. This is an issue that affects a lot of families, uh, including mine. And the reality is, that step one needs to be, and I'm not the physician at the table, but step one needs to be the Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm. That is unfortunately not what you've seen out of our nation's capital over the last couple of years. You've seen a real direct attempt to sabotage our healthcare system. For example, by pulling the plug on healthcare navigators, which help people sign up for affordable insurance, uh, by eliminating the provision of what's called cost sharing reductions that actually make it uh, possible to provide affordable insurance to people who have pre-existing conditions. I wasn't in Congress when the Affordable Care Act was passed. I don't think it's a perfect law, but it is undeniable that it has made progress on a number of levels. It is a good thing that young people, inclu including the college students that are here, can stay on their parents' insurance until their 26th birthday. It's a good thing that people are able to get uh, preventive care like mammograms and cancer screenings without a copay. It's a good thing that uh, that um, uh, people who have a pre-existing condition can't be discriminated against by their insurance company anymore. It's a good thing that we have things like mental health parity so that illnesses above the neck can be treated, treated the same as illnesses below the neck. Those are good things in our, in our current system. And so step one is stop sabotaging the current health care system. Step two is fix the parts that need fi fixing. There's a lot of things that we can do on that front. For example, funding the cost sharing reductions that actually enable the provision of, of insurance for people uh, with pre-existing conditions. We can have a system of reinsurance that would lower premiums for everybody, for employers and for, uh, for individuals. I also support having a public option so that uh, so that people could buy into the Medicare program and have uh, additional competition within our system. There's a lot more that needs to be done to ensure that people have access to affordable health care because in the greatest country on the planet, if you get sick or you get injured, you shouldn't go broke. Douglas. Thank you. Um, 
I think we can both agree that there no healthcare system is going to work unless we endorse the fact that we have to have coverage for pre-existing conditions. Um, I don't feel that uh, mental health integration actually is done nearly as well as it should be in our current environment and it's something we need to still work out. The reason I think our healthcare system isn't good enough right now to just continue doing what we're doing and try to refine it is that the healthcare system is, is centrally designed to make money for insurance companies and providers and that is what was the basis of the um, healthcare system we have now. We had a situation where there was actually, it looked like more of a universal coverage thing coming out and then we had the insurance companies get in and start talking, lobbying Congress and lobbying the President and then what we ended up having outside that door the next time was something that was very different, something that really served the insurance companies. And so I think we need to step back and instead of serving the insurance companies the way we have, we need to step back and say, how are we going to serve the people more? The problem with serving the insurance companies obviously is because they don't really have our best interest at heart. They have propagating their company's best interest at heart. So we need to go back, we need to realize that the biggest cost increases in healthcare over the last three decades hasn't been how much the doctor gets paid, how much the hospital gets paid, how much the drug companies make. It's actually been administrative costs, which has gone way, way up compared to all the other costs. And when we let the insurance companies right into that door and said, well, what are you guys willing to do? We, we gave up the ability to change that and we need to, we need to do that. Eric, you wish to respond? No, I guess the only other thing that I would mention is that um, one of the key drivers that we're hearing from constituents is concerned about rising pharmaceutical costs. And again, this is something where unfortunately you've seen largely inaction in our nation's capital. But there are things that we can do on this front. Uh, for example, there's a three-year backlog at the, at the FDA for the approval of generics. We know that by and large, generics are cheaper than the brand name prescriptions that we get. If we could expedite that process, that would be progress. Second, again, do no harm. Unfortunately, we've seen proposals to, uh, to undermine what's called the 340B program, which are vitally important to providers like Olympic Medical Center so that they can provide their patients with affordable prescription drugs. Uh, beyond that, right now we don't have really anything in government that's protecting consumers from price gouging. And we have a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that would that ensures that you don't get messed over by a financial institution. I think there's value in having something to protect consumers from getting uh, messed over by rising prescription drug prices. Douglas. Yeah, I, I would agree, actually. I think that the prescription drug prices is a, a costs are a big problem. And I think that actually not being able to have competitive prices by people that are trying to gouge others in the health system is a problem too, but we're not going to get that. We're not going to resolve those issues without more competition in the system instead of you know, having a universal system, having everybody be under the same health care. So we need to keep those kind of things in, in the back of our mind. That that's not the solution. The solution is maybe we have a different group of people paying. Maybe we continue to have employers pay, maybe we have the government step up so there is some kind of a public option, but we have to realize the most important thing to keep costs down is making sure that we all have as many options as possible, and I think that that's one of the things that is really absent in our plan right now. Okay, we'll take our first audience question. Okay, my name is Judy Demore. In 2016, Washington voters passed Initiative 735 to get big money out of elections and reduce the growing power of corporations over the rights of people by passing a constitutional amendment to establish that constitutional rights apply to natural persons only and not to entities like corporations and unions. And the campaign con contributions are not speech Your and must question. be regulated. In order Your question? To, okay, I just want people to understand the, what this is about. They, the, and um, the bill in the House for this amendment is HDR 48. It now has 65 co-sponsors, including Representative Kilmer. Um, we need this amendment more than ever now. My question, if elected, do you pledge to co-sponsor HDR 48 when it's reintroduced in the 116th Congress, and will you work to encourage 
the rest of our congressional delegations to support this There's bill too. This for both candidates. For both candidates. All right, we'll start with Douglas. I haven't read that bill, so I'm, I'm not going to say whether I'm going to support it or not support it because I don't know exactly what's in it. And as everybody in this room knows, there's usually more than one simple issue to a bill. But I'll address the question. And the question is, um, what are we going to do about the influence of special interests, political action committees, large employers on um, influencing our politics? And I think the answer simply is, as candidates, we don't take the money. We, we can legislate all we want, but, but the bottom line is we just don't do it. Um, I, I, haven't been, I haven't taken a cent from a political action committee. I haven't taken a cent from a special interest group. In fact, I haven't got a cent from the Republican Party. Um, it's, we just need to be citizens. We need to go out and represent our, the populace and represent as good as we can. And we don't need all that money. I mean, how much money has flown into the, the Shire and uh, Rossi. I mean, it's millions of dollars. It's ridiculous. That could be used so much better. Um, so I think that we need to do something about this, but I think the first thing we need to do is, as voters, we need to turn around and say, what are they taking? And, and if we're going to change it, we need to realize that a candidate is taking a lot of money from special interest groups and PACs and decide that's not right, and then vote accordingly. Derek? Um, the short answer is yes. I'll sponsor it again. I sponsored it already. Uh, I think, one, there's too much money in our politics. I think this problem was exacerbated by a Supreme Court decision called the Citizens United decision. I will tell you what I think. I don't think money is speech. I don't think corporations are people, period. And having, if it, if it requires amending the Constitution to make clear that money is not speech and corporations are not people, then I support amending the Constitution in that way. I will say I think there's more that needs to be done on this front. I'm a sponsor of a bill called the Government by the People Act that says let's focus on citizen financed elections and try to reduce the role of special interests in our politics. I'm a sponsor of a bill called the Disclose Act that says at the very least when you see this dark money flood into our political system, they should have to put their name on it. So we as citizens have a right to know who's in trying to influence our elections. I am the lead sponsor on a bill called the Honest Ads Act that says, as we've seen more money enter into our uh, online um, arena, that that ought to be regulated in the same way that TV ads and radio ads are. So we as citizens have some right to know who's spending what to try to influence our elections and, and also trying to keep foreign money out of our political system. And beyond that, I'm, a, I'm the lead sponsor of a bill that tries to put our referee back on the field. After Watergate, there was a federal agency called the uh, Federal Election Commission that was established to basically be the referee, to blow the whistle on political candidates that cheat. And it worked for quite some time, and now it doesn't. Now it's about as dysfunctional as Congress. And so we have a bill to try to change that. And it's actually a bipartisan bill that I worked on as part of the bipartisan working group. When we introduced that bill, it was the first bipartisan campaign finance reform bill in more than a decade. And that's important because we gotta get our referee back on the field, not to advantage one party or the other, but to advantage the American people and their, their say in their political system. Douglas, you wish to respond? Sure, the, the referee is the voters of the United States. I'll, I will sponsor any, co-sponsor I should say, any bill that comes out that wants to limit uh, big corporation, PAC money, special interest money in politics. But the thing I can do at first is I can set an example and simply not take it and allow people to realize that it's not influencing me, it's not making a difference in how I'm going to represent you. And every single politician in Washington DC has the ability to do that right now. Okay. Uh, question here. My name is Denise Mackenstadt, and I live in Squim. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is over 30 years old right now, and for the first time, an administration proposed a bill, HR 620, that would have gutted the mandates in the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was killed in the House on a party line. I ask both candidates, would you continue to support the ADA as it is now written so that all blind, all disabled people have equal access to society? Let's we'll start with Derek. Yes, uh, I support the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
Uh, there was a bill, as you mentioned, that sought to undermine the Americans with Disabilities Act and reduce some of the protections that are available to people with disabilities. I opposed that bill, um, and, uh, and I support people with disabilities and their access to, uh, uh, whether that be to a government building, a shopping center, or anything else. Douglas? Yeah, I mean, the American Disabilities Act is something that we're doing right in our society, and we need to keep supporting it in any way we can. Either of you want to respond? Say more? No? No, all right. Good. Thanks, good. Uh, my name is Sandy Goodwood. I live in Africa. Um, politics has become a profoundly unhealthy spectacle. And the antithesis of what I and teachers nationwide believe in. Um, I don't want any practice. This is for both of them. What ongoing, well thought out strategies will you consistently apply within your own party and within your work that that will um, go all the way beyond bipartisan to working together. We'll start with Douglas. I think we just, as representatives of our communities, we have to be 100% clear that we don't tolerate that kind of behavior. I think if there's a member of my party that's behaving that way, it's my job to step up and say that's not appropriate behavior. And anytime anybody asks me to do that, I'm going to do it. We, we know what's right and we know what's wrong. We, we need to be incredibly transparent and, and say when people are behaving poorly, that's what they're doing. Um, Trump behaves poorly. Um, Maxine Waters behaves poorly. I mean, we could, we could take a list of examples of everybody. We could say, you know, you can't say get up in their face. You, so many things, but we just need to stop doing those activities. And, and I, I will say right now that everybody that's doing that is wrong. Party, common sense transcends party lines, and we just need to not do those behaviors. Derek? So probably the most common question I get is, dear God, why would you want to be in Congress right now when it's such a mess and you got two little kids? And my response is always the same. It's because it's a mess and I got two little kids. I actually care about what kind of country they grow up in. And frankly, I don't want their future dictated by a completely screwed up federal government. And that has absolutely uh, uh, shaped my approach to this job. Um, when I uh, served in the legislature, before I started my service, I sat down with a guy named Tom Sw uh, Swayze. Tom was a Republican. I went to church with him, and he was part of the Rotary Club in Gig Harbor. And after I got elected, he said, let's go grab coffee. So I met him up at Starbucks in Gig Harbor, and he said, I got two words of advice for you. He said, first of all, with every bill that comes before you, vote what you think is right. He said, there's Democrats with good ideas and some Democrats with stupid ideas. And there's Republicans with good ideas and some with stupid ideas. Vote for the good ideas. Vote against the stupid ideas. Which doesn't sound like rocket science, but is too often missing in our current political system. The other thing he said to me was, with everything you work on, at least try to work in a bipartisan way. Because you will find that you come up with better solutions when you actually try to incorporate ideas from people across the spectrum. I'm proud of the fact you can go on GovTrack or look at the Luger Center website, and they identify me as one of the most bipartisan members of the United States House, and I'm proud of that. Um, I'm part of a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is a coalition of folks who are trying to actually find some common ground on some of these tough issues, including some that we've already discussed tonight. We just came out with a, a proposal called the Break the Gridlock proposal, and I encourage you, since I don't have enough time to go through the details of it, Google it. One of the things that we're looking at is trying to change the rules of the House so that it, if there is a proposal that has broad bipartisan support, how about it gets a vote? And if there is a proposal, for example, for once in a generation tax reform, that people get a chance to read it and a chance to amend it and a chance to actually have the legislative process the way it's intended to work. You wish to respond that to Douglas? Uh, just one thing, um, maybe two. Um, I actually didn't hear Representative Kilmer saying that he would admonish people in his party saying that they just can't have that behavior. I think that was unfortunate. Um, and if we're going to go ahead and talk about partisanship, 
I think what we need to do is focus on whether we're being partisan. I don't really care what one group says about how partisan a person is or another that's back in Washington, D.C., because I don't trust them in the first place. What I do trust is how a person votes and what a person says. So somebody that is talking about the balanced budget and whether we need an amendment for it and then votes no instead of supporting it along party lines, that tells me a lot more about whether we're bipartisan or not. So there's a lot of directions I could go. How much time do I get? One minute. One minute. Um, so first of all, I, I think it's important to just speak fact. Uh, when members of the Republican Party refer to the constitutional amendment that you're referring to as a sham, I agree with the Republicans who said it was a sham, that it wouldn't actually drive towards a balanced budget. And if we want to have a conversation about the specifics of it, I'd be eager to do that. Um, I absolutely have and will continue to speak out against members of both parties who I think uh, exhibit bullying behavior and in fact there's a group called the DC Bully Busters which was started by a group of middle school students here in the state of Washington and I've signed their pledge to speak out against that type of bullying from either party. Um, beyond that, I did something a little unusual, and that's I'm participating in a couple of congressional exchanges where I bought, brought Steve Womack, who's a very conservative Republican chairman of the Budget Committee, to my district. To, and then I'm going to go to his district. And part of the way we get a better understanding of where people are coming from is actually getting a better understanding of where people are coming from. And that's part of the reason I've been participating in that type of exchange. All right. Uh, over here, I think. Yes? My name is Libby Palmer, and um, I'd like to address this to both of you. Regardless of the rhetoric that's coming from Washington, I want to know how both of you would treat individual immigrants in the 6th District, and I'll do that by giving an example. Since several people have been intercepted by ICE and have been taken to the detention center in Tacoma, the one that I'm most concerned about is somebody who has lived in the 6th District for many years is the father of a United States born, three United States born citizen children. He owns his own business. He's paid taxes throughout his working career. His family has initially given that The question is what would you do to help individuals such as him? And we'll start with Derek. Let me answer that in two ways. Part of what a congressional office does is what we call casework where if a person with an individual um, or a family is dealing with any federal agency, including immigration issues, we go to work on their behalf. Oftentimes we do that in partnership with immigrants' rights organizations. Um, and uh, I've been to that detention center and I've met with people who've been impacted uh, by this administration's approach to immigration. Second, there's a policy question here, and that is, um, what do we do with our immigration system writ large? I think it's currently broken. And I think the approach that this administration has taken has exacerbated some of those problems. Here's what I'm for. I'm for comp comprehensive immigration reform. Here's what that means. Uh, a comprehensive solution involves addressing border security, frankly, not just at our southern border, but at our northern border and at our ports. It means trying to fix the system of legal immigration to make illegal immigration less attractive. It means trying to level the playing field so that those employers that are working hard and playing by the rules are not put at a competitive disadvantage against those that are, are not. And then finally, uh, the comprehensive immigration reform bill that I am a co-sponsor of addresses the issue of what do you do with the 11 to 12 million people who are currently in our country who lack legal status. And what that bill proposes is creating a pathway to citizenship. It requires passing a criminal background check, going to the back of the line, paying back taxes and fines and penalties, and then working your way through the immigration system. I think that's important because the, the, the notion of uh, breaking up families that are otherwise law-abiding doesn't make sense to me. Trying to spend your tax dollars trying to find and deport 11 to 12 million people doesn't make sense to me. We're a nation of immigrants. I'm the son of an immigrant. 70 years and two weeks ago, my family came to this country. My mom came to this country. But we're also a nation of laws, and I think it's important that we modernize our laws to keep up with today's reality. Douglas. So I am in agreement with DACA. I think that the kids uh, uh, that have been here their whole life, been educated here, um, are providing services to communities, have lives in front of them that are going to be productive. I think that we need to find a way to keep them here. 
However, I think that we need to realize that our, our system is initially broken. Our system hasn't really even been tried for years. Um, if, if we find somebody here that's here illegally, I, I think, and I'll just answer your question directly, I think that the father should be sent back to the country he came from. And then we should work however we can to get the family reunited. He commits some level of a crime when he comes here against our laws, and we can't just say, it doesn't matter. Um, we, can, we need to do what we need to do. We need to enforce the laws and then get the family back together. Um, we, we have a lot of people that have, you know, been asylum seekers, and I think that that's an important part of what we do as a country. But I think that if we have somebody coming to try to get asylum, that doesn't mean that we let them freely integrate into our society until we've decided whether to give them asylum or not. We give them the opportunity to seek asylum, and we keep the family together. And then once we've decided whether they should come into our country or not, then the decision is final. And we, we, we endorse them with open arms, just like we do with all legal immigrants. We just need to, we have to be a citizen, we have to be a country of laws, and we have to remember that people that violate the law just because it's been a certain period of time don't deserve amnesty from it. So I, I would send the father home, and, and I would work to find a way we could get them back legally. That's the specific question you asked, and that's, that's how I feel. Derek, the response? Uh, Douglas, you want to add? No. Okay. All right, question here. Okay. We have a question um, from the audience. This is from Sandra Dickerson, and I'm assuming it's for both candidates. Uh, Senator McConnell recently stated Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid need substantial cuts to avoid a continued increase in the deficit. What is your position on Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid cuts? We'll start with the list. Sure. Um, Medicare and Social Security are programs that we've been funding throughout our whole life, and they're promises to us, and we can't cut them. That's just the bottom line. Um, there's plenty of money in the federal budget that we can cut and not have an $800 billion deficit every year. We need to start bringing things back to the state level and the county level and the local level where they should be done instead of trying to mass billions of dollars in Washington, D.C. to deal with local issues. And part of that is, of course, cutting taxes to allow the tax revenue base to be available to Port Angeles. Um, Clallam County, Washington State, and we need to really focus away from D.C., where we all have the least amount of control in what happens to our taxpayer dollars. So we can do that, and that's the solution to this. The solution is growing out of the deficit and reorganizing the federal government so that we're not doing things in places we shouldn't do them. We're going to continue to fund Medicare. We're going to continue to fund Social Security. You know, Congress along the way has decided that they can rob money from Social Security and keep spending it. And that's part of the $21 trillion we owe is several trillion dollars to Social Security Trust Fund. Um, I, I don't understand as citizens of the United States how we ever let people do that to us. So we, we need to be more aware, more aggressive, and, and demand better. And a balanced budget amendment is part of that. We tell people, you can't spend more money than you get. And it, it makes people stand up and do what they need to do. It makes, gives politicians the courage to cut things that need to be cut. Without the balanced budget amendment, it's just going to keep going the way it is. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just touch on where he ended. The, the uh, Council for the Preservation of Social Security and Medicare opposed the balanced budget amendment that Doug has suggested he supports, in part because they see it as a threat to Social Security and Medicare. They also opposed the tax cut that where 80% of the benefit went to the wealthiest and to large corporations. This is an area of disagreement between the two of us. Um, here's what I'll tell you. I think Social Security and Medicare are a promise to the American people. These are not entitlements. These are earned benefits. You paid into it, you should get it. Um, I will tell you, I had never been to a financial planner until we had our second kid, and it was actually kind of frightening the first question I got. The first question I got was, do you want to presume Social Security is there when you retire? 
And my response was, you're darn right I want to assume that Social Security is there when I retire. And I think the concern that I have when you hear comments by Senator McConnell about needing to make cuts to Social Security and Medicare is that it would have a profound effect on seniors and their ability to retire with dignity. Response, Douglas? I'll just say that um, we don't have to cut Medicare. We don't have to cut Social Security. We funded them just like Derek said and I said before. Um, what I disagree with what he just said is about the tax cuts. I, I mean, I think that a larger portion of the money probably went to people that pay more money in the first place. And for one, I'm one of the people in, in the United States where my basic um, tax rate went up <laughs> in, in the plan. But I think it's fine. It's, it's, we need to fund our government well enough. But we needed to unleash small business and corporations from the burdens they had of taxes so that they could actually invest more money back in their country, more money in the people who work for them. Lots of people got bonuses from that. We need to realize that corporations and small business is how we're going to grow out of this problem. It's not what Washington, D.C. is going to do. Stimulus packages in Washington, D.C. don't work. It works when we let the people in our country do the work on the problem. Derek? I want to talk specifically about a bill that I'm a co-sponsor of. It's called the Social Security 2100 Act. And it focuses on really a couple things. One, trying to extend the life of Social Security so that it maintains its solvency, so that not just current retirees, but future retirees are able to retire with dignity. Beyond that, it proposes moving to something called the Consumer Price Index Elderly, so that the cost of living adjustments under the Social Security system actually address the needs of elderly people. We know that elderly people have costs that are different. You know, pharmaceutical costs, for example, where you can't substitute out another, project, uh, another product. And so that bill would propose um, changing the, the uh, Consumer Price Index so that seniors could actually uh, have their benefits go up in the same way their, their costs are going up. Um, I'm concerned about some proposals you've seen in our nation's capital, including a proposal uh, to voucherize our Medicare, uh, our, our Medicare system. I oppose that. Uh, it doesn't, um, to me, it doesn't fulfill our responsibility to seniors. All right, our next question. So, <clears throat> I'm at, at Bowen, and on the subject of National Park Service maintenance backlog and bills that are being considered on the Hill. I'm going to kind of modify my run on sentence. What comment, and I'm going to add ideas, or what commitment, what ideas will you make to ensure the priority use of any such funding solutions go to addressing access to our park? And I want to add a topic that was previously talked about, access for ADA. Is this for both candidates? And we will start with Derek. So um, I'm one of the lead sponsors on a bill to address the maintenance backlog within our national park system. Um, I actually think that that bill will likely pass before the year is out. And that is good news for us here on the Olympic Peninsula. Listen, our park is an amazing uh, generator of economic opportunity in this region. We have a lot of local businesses that benefit because of the presence of that park. It is the crown jewel, but the crown jewel's getting a little rusty. And it, it, you know, we have, a, as a nation, a more than $12 billion maintenance backlog. The bill that I'm a sponsor of would make a significant dent in that maintenance backlog. And thankfully, it's a bipartisan proposal, and I think it's got a good head of steam behind it. It would look at, uh, at access issues. It would look at other issues as well, including things like uh, wastewater systems, because you also don't want to have a failing wastewater system that might, again, further befoul our crown jewels. Um, it would, uh, you know, I just was up with uh, Sarah Creechbaum and some of the team here on the Olympic. Part of the discussion we had was around ADA accessibility, and they look at that as a, a, a responsibility, as an obligation to ensure that every American can enjoy our national parks. You know, uh, in the Ken Burns documentary, he referred to our national parks as America's best idea. I think that's really true. These are extraordinary assets, and I think it's important that we address this maintenance backlog. Douglas. 
So, I mean, the maintenance backlog is important. There's no question about it. We need to figure out a way to pay for the resources that we have. One of the things that I might consider, and this is going to be quite different than what people are thinking, is the entire Olympic Park actually lies within the state of Washington. I'm not sure why we can't just give the park to the state of Washington and let them manage it, let the people that live around it have more control on what goes on in the park, how we fund the park, how accessible the park is, and then have more control at a local level instead of having the federal government send money over from thousands of miles away. So uh, there's value in having a national park system. In part, it means that we have a stewardship ethic nationwide for our national parks. But in part, it means that those maintenance obligations, Ed, that you asked about, that cost is not entirely borne by the taxpayers of Washington State. That's a good thing. It is a good thing that, as a nation, we collectively say these are public assets that we want to maintain. Uh, and that that cost is not entirely borne by the residents of the Olympic Peninsula. Douglas? So this is a fundamental difference between me and Representative Kilmer. I think that the, the focus of the federal government should be on securing our borders, keeping us safe as citizens, and protecting our free market. I don't think the federal government has a role in helping us decide what we're going to do with things that are entirely inside our state. I think that we need to change our focus. We're sending so much money to Washington, D.C., where the importance of the issue is, is getting lost because the issues are further away from the people who feel like they are important. And we need to think about this. We, we can't just keep doing what we're doing and tracking up, you know, building up $21 trillion of debt, putting our, our kids' futures at risk. We, we have to change something. We have to have new ideas. Question here. Hello, my name is McKenna. As we know, based off of data from the BLS website, women and minorities in government and leadership make less money and obtain lower positions in leadership compared to men on average. What will you do in explicit terms to correct this imbalance and create more opportunities for economic growth for these groups during your term? And this is for both candidates. Absolutely. All right, then we will start with Douglas. Sure. I think the most important issue in this question is making sure that everybody has equal opportunity to get educated at the level they need to get a job. And then the next step is actually holding everybody in our society um, responsible for choosing the best people that are available. Um, we need to try to get away from saying we have to hire 10 people of this color, or 10 people of that color, or 10 people of this race, or 10 people of this sex. We need to focus on the real problem, which is why are people making the wrong decisions? And we need to hold everybody accountable. If we have Microsoft and we find out that Microsoft is, is not hiring women and not paying women as much, we need to know that, we need to learn that, and then we, as people in our society, need to use our wallets to hold Microsoft accountable. That's what we need to do. We need to take the power back into our own hands and do those kind of activities, rather than wait for somebody else to do it for us. There's no reason why Congress in Washington, D.C. has to tell us that this is an appropriate behavior. We need to do what we need to do. We don't need people making numbers telling us percentages. We need to just do what's right. Gary. Uh, let me directly address your, your issue. Um, I think we should embrace the notion of equal pay for equal work, period. And there's a bill that would do that in Congress. It's a, a bill called the Paycheck Fairness Act, which says explicitly that people who do the same job should get paid the same regardless of gender. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill, I support that bill, and I think Congress ought to pass that bill. Um, beyond that, I think you raise a point, though, that goes beyond that, uh, that, that issue, and that gets at some of the other challenges uh, that provide barriers to, to the workplace. I'm a proponent of expanding some of the tools within the tax code that can help make work uh, more workable 
uh, for families, whether that be things like the child care tax credit so that people can actually afford to go to work, uh, or things like the earned income tax credit that help make work pay. You bet. Response, Douglas? Yeah. Um, I think uh, Representative Kilmer has, has, has had two bills that he's actually sponsored pass um, in his terms in office. We, we don't have time to, to depend on Congress doing everything for us. We need to do it ourselves. We need to start taking responsibility. When I see somebody treated unfairly, of course they should be treated fairly. But trying to go to Washington DC and make a law for it is not gonna get us to where we need to because it doesn't happen quick enough. The only way it happens quick enough is if we vote to some extent by our wallet. So if somebody is not going to treat women fairly, pay them the same as men, we need to know about it. They need to come out and tell us so we can respond to it appropriately. I, I'm, I'm not gonna wait for Washington DC to, to do everything for us anymore. We can't, we, we don't have time. Our children don't have time, our grandchildren don't have time. It's proven to a large extent that they can't do it. We need something different. Derry. Um, I certainly agree with the notion of speaking out against those who might be acting in a discriminatory way, but I guess there is a, a disagreement here in that I don't think that, uh, that the government should simply step away and say, we'll abide by discrimination happening. I think there is a role for government to step in, whether women are being discriminated against, or people with disabilities are being discriminated against, or, uh, or people of color are being discriminated against. Um, we have uh, laws in place, civil rights laws, the American Disabilities Act, I hope to see the Paycheck Fairness Act put in place, because we, can't, we cannot simply say everyone will do the right thing. And that's why we have these laws in place. Beyond that, um, since the point was made, I'm proud of the fact uh, that an article in the Washington Post made me one of the five most effective Democrats in the United States House. And I'm happy to put my record up against anybody. Uh, question over here. Hi, my name is Ricky Talbot. I am with the school newspaper. And the question I have is, uh, there's rumors of a new green infrastructure projects going on. How will this affect Port Angeles and the college uh, by the policies that you have against pollution in the district? Uh, directed to both candidates. All right. We'll start with Derek. Sure. This is a good question, and it's something I was just working on earlier today, so I appreciate the question. Um, so green infrastructure projects that we're, we're uh, focused on are things like uh, rain gardens and permeable pavement that help prevent things like stormwater runoff from going into whether it be the harbor here in Port Angeles or into Puget Sound. Why is that important? Well, it's important because Washington State University just came out with a study that found that toxic stormwater runoff is one of the primary reasons for large-scale fish kills, for, particularly among coho, coho salmon. For those of, of us who followed what's happened with the orca, uh, unfortunately, toxicity levels in our orca are very high. And so addressing what's going into our water is important. So what do we do about it? Just last week, I introduced a bill along with Congressman Denny Heck that would provide, in essence, an incentive for, uh, for communities and for private industry to make these sorts of investments in things like permeable pavement and in green stormwater infrastructure. It's not a mandate, but it's a tool. It would provide, in essence, cheap money through something called private activity bonds that provide, um, it's the same kinds of bonds that communities use to do things like build airports or do things that have a, 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 a public purpose. This is a public purpose that, you know, if I was down last week in, in Iwako and out in Westport talking with fishermen, they're very concerned about this because it's affecting fish runs uh, and their ability to make a living. This is a very substantial cost to communities. When we don't address these problems upstream, we end up paying for it on the down, on downstream and having to do cleanup and having to do, whether that be the uh, restoration of Puget Sound or the restoration of the harbor here in Port Angeles. The investments that we could make on the front end could end up saving taxpayers a whole lot of money. And that's why I think this is an important thing not to ignore. Douglas. Yeah, I think that, um, Supporting green infrastructure is important. Um, I support green infrastructure by you know, trying to drive my smaller car more than my larger car. 
Um, we need to all support green infrastructure. We need to make decisions on a daily basis as to how we're going to do that. If we see something that might cost us a little bit more to help protect the environment, we need to buy it and we need to step forward and do those things in our society. I don't think, using the orca as an example, I don't think trying to send money to Washington DC to protect the orca is the right thing to do. I think we need to send less money to Washington DC so the people in the state of Washington can decide how they're gonna protect the orca. We, we need to take care of things on a local basis. We need to take care of things in our home. We can't wait for Washington DC to do it for us. There is things that we have to do to protect the free market on a federal level and infrastructure, public highways, airports, those are all things, even ports to some degree, are things that we need to support for that reason. But these other things, we should deal with them locally, where we can actually have the best ideas, the most available information, and people that are close to the problem figuring out this is how much money we need, this is what we need to raise the taxes for, and then we can raise the tax on a local level or a state level because we have some money in our budgets to do it because it hasn't all gone to Washington, D.C. Response. Well, this is an area of disagreement. Um, I, I think there is value in having federal support for our national parks. We may disagree on that, but I think the national parks are a good thing. And I think the people of Port Angeles think that too. I think it is a good thing to have federal support for the restoration of Puget Sound. And this came up at a prior debate. We disagree on that. I think it is a good thing. The Puget Sound is a jewel. It is part of who we are. And I do not think that the recovery of Puget Sound, that that cost should be borne entirely by the taxpayers of Washington State. Just like I don't think that the cleanup of the Chesapeake Bay should be paid entirely by the people of Maryland. Um, I think uh, there are programs like the Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund, which this administration took a similar approach that Doug has suggested, which is saying, well, that's a problem for the people of Washington State. I'm proud of the fact that as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I've stood up for the recovery of our salmon so that that cost isn't borne entirely by the taxpayers of Washington State and so that we can protect our salmon. Question over here. Hi, my name is David Harvey, and I'm a Peninsula College student, and my question is for both candidates. Um, according to a study by Georgetown University, by the year 2020, two years from now, 65% of all U.S. jobs will require post-secondary education. Currently, myself and millions of Americans are indebting ourselves just so that we can be part of 65% of the workforce. Will you or will you not support initiatives to guarantee a free, public, four-year college education as a right to all Americans? And we'll start with Doug. Douglas? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, but, I mean... What's the dropout rate in most uh, technical schools? It's, it's way, way over 50%. Um, community colleges have a very high dropout rate too. If, if we pay for everybody to go to school, it's, it's not gonna mean enough to some of the people that are going into school. You have to earn it, you have to go do it. Having loans available is very important. We need to make it so people that are ready to do it can actually do it. But just saying that everybody has another right that's gonna cost our society billions, maybe even trillion dollars, is, is not the way to take care of this problem. It's, it's overstepping the bounds of what government should do. We're, we're responsible for ourselves. We don't have to have everything handed to us. We, we, need, to, we need to take responsibility for our own lives. And, and having the government step in and do this is just, it's just not what we should be doing as a government. Derek? So, um, first of all, um, thanks for being here. Uh, listen, not everyone's going to go to college, but I think we recognize that there's some value in providing that door of educational opportunity to more people. I'll say up front, I couldn't have gone to college if it hadn't been for financial aid. I got all of it. I got grants and I got loans and I washed dishes in the college dining room, which my wife believes is the best skill I learned in college. Um, and frankly, this community stepped up and provided a lot of scholarships to help me pay, uh, pay for college. Um, I think you identify a legitimate problem statement. Student debt has now surpassed credit card debt in this country. And that is absolutely slamming the ability of students to both study things that they want to study, and it's 
um, delayed home ownership in this country because people are so overburdened uh, by, by their student debt. It's even delayed um, uh, starting, uh, starting businesses and starting families. You've seen a higher number of people moving back in with their parents, which as a parent kind of freaks me out. Um, and so what do we do about it? Well, one, um, I think the focus should be on middle class and poor families and providing them with more resources to be able to afford college. Um, I've been a proponent of expanding Pell Grants so that we um, have Pell Grants keep pace with inflation um, so that as tuition uh, costs go up, so, so does grant-based aid. Two, I have a disagreement with the current administration. Um, they propose uh, pulling the plug on federally subsidized student loans. Here's the value of federally subsidized student loans. It means that if you're a student getting a federal loan, that you don't have to make payments until you're done with school. That's a good thing. It means that you don't start accruing interest until you're done with school. That's a good thing. And so um, as your representative, I've stood up and said we should, we should protect those sources of financial aid so more people can go to college without being overburdened by student debt. Douglas. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've benefited as much as Representative Kilmer has from our system that exists today. Um, I, when I was going through the University of Washington in my um, first degree, I did a work study and I took loans. I, I am not saying that any of those programs should not be available to people. I just think that we're going way beyond that to say that education is a right. We have to be really careful when we think about, hey, you have a new right. We, we, <laughs> we, we can't, as a society, take more responsibility away from a person. We both worked really hard. We've taken advantage of what's out there for us to take advantage of. We've, we've made the most out of what society has offered us, what our government has offered us. That's what we need people to do. It doesn't need to be free. You, you need to say, this is what I want to do. I want to invest in myself and get this education. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to have loans, and I'm going to pay them back. We need to make that decision for ourselves, not expect it to just be free. Derek. Um, I just want to mention one other lever within the financial aid portfolio, and that is work study. Um, one of the things that I've been working on is trying to see work study be something other than uh, just cheap labor for the college and university. Um, we've got a, a proposal uh, that would um, try to have more work study pl placements be in something that could actually lead to a career for a student. So that when they do work study, they both get that support and helping to pay for their tuition. But they also maybe make a connection uh, with an employer, or maybe they develop a skill uh, that they could use when they enter the workforce. I think there's great value in that, and my hope is that you can see Congress take action on a proposal like that. You bet. Is there a question over here? I know there's a couple here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Eileen Schmitz. I live in Squim, one of the younger residents. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you both for coming out to the peninsula today. And Dr. Dykeman, I have a question for you. What is your opinion of, and do you support Paul Ryan's proposed voucher system for Medicare? Sorry, who did you direct it to? Dr. Dykeman. Oh, thank you. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't know what Paul Ryan's voucher system is for Medicare. I mean, if you want to give me any kind of specific, I'll comment on it. Um, I, I really just don't know what he's trying to do. Um, please. To set more limits, sorry, to set more <laughs> limits, um, to set more limits on, on what people can and can't do with Medicare and um, to restrict it much more? Uh, Medicare is something that we've all paid into. We knew what we were getting and we should get what we paid into. If they're trying to restrict it more, that's not okay. Okay, Derek? Yeah, I, I'm very concerned about what we've seen proposed in Congress by, uh, by Speaker Ryan and by others who think that we should end the Medicare guarantee and instead uh, turn it into a voucher program. I think my concern primarily is driven by the fact that it doesn't pass the My Grandma test. What do I mean by that? Well, 
what Speaker Ryan has proposed is rather than giving people a guarantee of Medicare so that their uh, medical costs are covered when they go see a, a, a medical provider, he suggests giving them a coupon and having them shop the private insurance market. I'm 44. I think it's complicated to shop the private insurance market. My grandma's 108. When I show her um, the internet on my phone, she thinks it's the devil. Um, and so, you know, in essence, giving her a coupon and saying, okay, Oma, go shop the private insurance market and try to navigate all these decisions, I think violates the spirit uh, under which Medicare was established in the first place, which is that it was something that people paid into and they have a right to the medical care that they paid into. And I don't think that Congress should pull the plug on that or pull the rug out from under our seniors. Yeah, I, I would say if the voucher program basically actually guarantees you the same level of care and the real purpose of it is to try to allow you to go out and choose where you want to get that care, um, I, I'm, that's great. But I, I'm hearing two different things is what it's really all about. Um, if, if the voucher program really is designed to make sure people get the care, having the free market involved with that to get people the most care for the same amount of money and having corporations and companies compete against each other for the money is a good idea. If that means that they're not gonna get the care they need because of the system, then it's, it, we can't do it. It's just a no starter. Derek? No, I said what I had to say. Oh, okay. All right. Vicki <laughs> Rudin, Port Angeles. The current administration has again raised the specter of privatizing the U.S. Postal Service. I, I'd like Derek to address this first because I'd like to know what, this, what the sense of Congress is to a suggestion like that. And then I'd like to hear from the other candidate. Derek? Um, well, I want to address your direct question, but um, it's hard to speak for Congress, right? Because there's 435 members and people are all over the map. I can speak for this member of Congress. I don't, I don't support privatizing the Postal Service. I think that's a bad idea. It's particularly a bad idea for rural communities um, for whom, you know, if, if, if there is simply a profit motive, uh, what we would see, I think, in rural communities is less quality service. Um, probably higher cost service, and that's not something I support. There are uh, there is legislation in Congress to try to address some of the funding shortfalls within the postal service. I'm a sponsor of uh, of one of those bills. Um, among other things, you know, right now the biggest driver of 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 the Postal Service's financial problem is the fact that several years back, uh, Congress created a requirement that uh, the Postal Service pre-fund <clears throat> all benefits. Literally, the Postal Service is now uh, having to pay for um, retirement for people who haven't been born yet, let alone who haven't worked for the Postal Service yet. So it's no wonder, I mean, I literally, I worked in private industry for years there's no private company that has an obligation like that, and yet the Postal Service has that obligation. And so, from, uh, from a balance sheet standpoint, that puts them underwater. If you set that aside, their operations are actually in the black. Uh, and so, uh, my starting point is, what's the, what's the problem you're trying to solve by privatizing it? I think privatizing it would create far more problems than it would solve. Douglas. Yeah, I, I actually agree. I think that the um, Postal Service is something that's very important for our uh, country to have free flow of information between citizens, between businesses, and that it's part of protecting our free market. So I think privatizing it would be a mistake. Any additional comments? Yeah, the only thing I'll add, too, is just trying to get at how big a deal this is for people. Um, on a number of fronts, so it's a big deal for seniors who might be able to get, uh, whether it be a social security check or a prescription in the mail. It's a big deal for local employers who might need supplies through the postal service to be able to run their business. Um, and it's even a big deal from the standpoint of uh, just the um, human interaction. 
that postal carriers provide to the to the citizens that they serve. You know, I've interacted with a lot of seniors, and it's a, it's it's maybe it shouldn't be surprising to me how often this issue comes up, both around protecting the postal service and protecting um, six day delivery. And what often comes up when I hear from seniors is, I really like my post person. It's you know I I, I get human interaction uh, with them and I value that and I don't think that Congress should pull the plug on that. Any additions for you, Doug? No, I, I think that the Postal Service and the human interaction of course is very important. I interact with senior citizens every day and uh, a lot of times they come to the office and the main reason is just because they want to touch base and have some interaction with somebody and, and that's really crucial for all of us in every stage of our life. So. I think that's another benefit of it. Okay, I don't see questioners there, so we have a question here. Thank you for coming here. My name's Ron Richards. Uh, we've heard tonight, uh, rightful from Cell, how important Olympic National Park is, and the Puget Sound, and the Orcas. Presently, the naval operations out of Whidbey Island are posing a huge risk and, and a lot of damage to all of these treasures that we have. What will you do, if anything, to get the growlers out of Olympic National Park and to reduce the number of operations on the island? For both candidates? Yes. All right, we'll start with Douglas. I just want to reiterate that I think all of us understand how important these treasures are. I think it's just a difference of opinion on how we think we should go about caring for them in the next hundreds of years, just, just to make that clear. I think that um, the growlers possibly can be made so they're not such an impact. I remember when I was working out in Forks, um, you could hear them out there, and you, you would look up and you couldn't see them anywhere. And it was you know, irritating my dogs to no end. They'd run from one end to the, uh, of their yard to the other barking at them. They didn't see them either. Um, I think that we have to try to do something to mitigate the noise, but I don't think that means moving the base somewhere else. Um, we all have to basically have some burden for our, our national defense, and I think that we need to find the right, um, the right level of burden, and maybe it, it will require some modifications to the plane so they're not as loud. I, I don't have any idea where, if we weren't going to have them there, where we put them. And I know that the community where we move them to would have the same concerns. So I don't think we could just start moving planes around. Um, we have to find a, a creative um, solution, and, and we have to, some, to some degree, accept the noise. Derek? So um, let me try to cover four things in two minutes. Uh, one, you know, so these issues when the Navy or any federal agency is considering something that has an impact like this, that's governed by what's called NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And part of my role as your representative is one to ensure fidelity to that process, to make sure that decisions are science-based to make sure that the public has a right to weigh in. So for example, when the comment periods weren't, I think, adequate to allow the public to weigh in, I pushed to extend them, succeeding in getting them to extend those comment periods so citizens had a say in the process. There is not a step in the NEPA process uh, that says go get approval or disapproval from your local member of Congress. That's probably a good thing, quite frankly, because I don't think you want these decisions uh, being made by politics. You want them being made, made based on science. Second, um, in my role, I've uh, pushed for the Navy to actually in, in increase its interaction with the Park Service. So now that there is a regular interaction between the Park Superintendent and the Naval Base, that's a good thing because uh, we only through that kind of interaction and communication can they look at actions that might uh, both measure sound and mitigate the impact from those growler flights. Three, I engaged a federal agency that I admit I did not know existed until this issue came up. It's called FICAN, the Federal Interagency Commission on Aircraft Noise. Yep, that exists. And um, asked them to bring some data to this discussion 
so that we actually have some understanding of where are these planes flying, how loud are they, what are the other things that are flying over the park, and have some data as part of the conversation. And then finally, um, this year I was able to secure some funding in the defense budget to look specifically at reducing the sound of these growlers. I think that's important as well, um, whether that be through mufflers or some other sorts of technology, hopefully we can see some reduction in sound. Response, Douglas? I don't really have much more to add except for I don't think we've seen any change in, in the problem. Um, so this may be an example of how the federal government isn't really going to make the changes we need it to do. Maybe we need to start doing something more on a local level. Maybe the state needs to do something. Maybe the county needs to do something. We need to start working on other ways to approach the problem. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add is the Navy's been a neighbor for a long time. Um, they do important work. All of us, everybody in this room and outside of this room, wants to ensure that our airmen, are, 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 our pilots are properly trained. But it's important that when the Navy's a neighbor, that it be a good neighbor and that it uh, take into consideration the concerns of communities like this. I grew up here. Um, I understand uh, that people don't want their summer evenings disrupted by loud noise, and um, it's part of the reason I've advocated uh, for the process uh, to incorporate the views of the public and, um, as, as they consider actions like this. All right, question over here. Mike Tetro, Port Angeles. Um, I'll leave this kind of open for both, both of you. Um, and basically, just throw out there log exports and mill closures in the area and uh, your thoughts on that. Uh, Derek? Um, I got into this job because I grew up here um, it's, uh, and I saw the impact of the timber industry decline on our community and that's absolutely influenced how I've approached this job. One of the things I'm proudest of is that we um, uh, put together something called the Olympic Forest Collaborative, which was a group of folks from the timber industry and from the conservation community that have worked together to try to identify how do we manage the federal forests in a way that works better for everybody, that enhances forest health, uh, and that increases harvest levels off of the Olympic. And the good news, I can tell you, is that it's, it's working. We actually, last year, saw the highest level of harvest off of the Olympic that we've seen in two decades. That's a good thing. Beyond that, I think there's other opportunities for the timber industry um, uh, so that we continue, you know, the timber industry has been and will continue to be an important employer here on the, on the peninsula. Um, the, uh, uh, some of it may look a little different. So for example, we've looked at trying to spur innovation through uh, uh, mass timber products like cross-laminated timber. Um, in Squim, um, I don't, uh, in Squim, they uh, built a school building out of cross laminated timber. Um, we were able to get some language in the military construction bill, encouraging the Defense Department to look at these sort of wood-based construction options again to create a market and hopefully to provide opportunities for new built mills to be built uh, here on the Olympic Peninsula and all around the country. Douglas. I think I look at the National Forest actually as being a resource first for the communities on the peninsula. And I think we need to, to keep that focus. We have the Olympic National Park. Um, it's, it's the jewel. It's where we go if we want to see nature at its finest. But we have to have a good balance between the ability to have our kids raised in the peninsula and um, controlling the environmental impact. and. So the national forests are, are for resources, they're for jobs, and we need to maximize that as much as we can. And having said that, we need to make sure that we don't transition big portions of the national forest into a more protected status, which is something Representative Kilmer has been sponsoring for a long time, and I, I think that we just need to avoid doing that. So the national forests are for jobs, and we need to focus on that. A response, Derek? I think one of the good things, uh, particularly that we've seen out of the collaborative and as part of some of these other discussions as well, 
is that we've rejected the false choice between protecting environmentally sensitive areas that need protection and ensuring that there's jobs in other parts of the forest. Um, that's the approach I've taken uh, as your representative to protect the, par the parts that are environmentally sensitive and to try to increase harvest levels in a responsible way to provide more job opportunities on the peninsula. Um, that'll continue to be my approach. Douglas, response? I don't think it matters what the wood product is. The bottom line is we need wood. So uh, the national forests are, are there to provide that wood. If, if we can do cross-laminated material, if we can do any other thing to use the resources that we have, we need to use it as maximally as we can. And if there's technologies that come along to let us grow even more economically from the availability of that resource, we need to take advantage of it. All right, uh, questions? All right, one. He said it's his second time to the mic. Oh, that's all right, because that's his second time too. Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm going to give you one. Hello again, David Harvey again, <laughs> Central College student again. Will you or will you not support legislation to bring the United States as a nation in line with the Paris Agreement, which deals with anthropogenic climate change mitigation, adaptation, and finance starting in 2020? Or would you at least support U.S. specific science based legislation that would regulate the greenhouse gas emissions of U.S. corporations? Both candidates, correct? Okay, Douglas, your turn. So what I'm going to support is further research in the area of climate change. I don't think that we definitively know whether um, man is causing all the changes or not. I know that we hear from the media that 97% of all um, climatologists think that man is making the change. The reality is that's not an accurate statistic, but we can keep saying it over and over and over enough until everybody in this room perhaps believes it's true. We need to do more research and find out how this is impacting us, and then we need to do research and find out how we're going to change it. We don't have the right questions and we don't have the right answers. So I mean, the Republican Party wants to say we shouldn't spend any more time looking at climate change. It's just absolutely not fair. I mean, my opinion is if it's there, it's a big, big deal and we need to do something about it. So I support keeping an open mind, but I think right now, We've moved our open mind to a point where we're just thinking that no matter what we're hearing in the media, it's actually the way it is. So let's just keep looking at the issue. Let's find out what the science really tells us and then make really good informed decisions. Derek? I think climate change is real. I think human beings contribute to it. And I think it's time for politicians to stop kowtowing to the fossil fuels industry and step up and do something about it. Um, listen, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. We're seeing them here in our region. I represent 11 Native American tribes, four of our coastal tribes that as we sit in this auditorium are in the process of trying to move to higher ground because of more severe storms and encroaching sea levels, not to mention the threat of tsunami. There are 3,200 people in the district I represent whose jobs are tied to growing shellfish. And they look at this as an existential threat to their livelihoods because you're already seeing change in ocean chemistry that's affecting the ability of oysters to form shells. Um, the, we saw a forest fire on the, really 10 seconds? Okay, sorry, I got a minute. Will you give me another 10 seconds because I was asking. Um, <laughs> You know, we saw a forest fire that burned for weeks in the rainforest. I don't know about the rest of you, I've never seen the weather app on my, for, on my phone have the weather be smoke um, until the last few years. The Department of Defense says that climate change is a threat multiplier. So the Department of Defense acknowledges that climate change is real and that we should do something about it. I think it's embarrassing that the United States is the only country on the planet that's not party to the Paris Climate Agreement. And I think that, uh, that we should be a part of it. Response, Douglas. Yeah, I think the Paris Climate Agreement is, is made to try to make a change in the world. I think that we need to decide what is the right change for ourselves. Um, we're, we're responsible for our own livelihood. We're responsible for what we do in the future. We don't need um, every other country in the world telling us what we should do. We need to take 
the time. We need to research this issue. We need to find out what is actually happening. And there is scientists at every level on both sides of this issue, despite what we get told on Channel 4 and Channel 5 and CNN. It's there. This is not a definitive thing. Client, you know, man's effect on the weather is, is not even at a theory. It's still a hypothesis. The data doesn't even exist to make it a theory. It's not that strong of a link yet. I don't think we should close our eyes to it, but we need to realize that we're not getting the information that we need to get about this. Response, Derek? Let me, um, let me reiterate, I think we should be part of a global solution. It's not America warming, it's global warming. It's climate change is affecting everybody. Um, there are things that we can do at the local, state, and federal level, things like smart grid technology, uh, efforts to look at al al alternative energy sources that aren't, aren't carbon-based, efforts to try to reduce carbon emissions. I think it's a real shame that the, uh, that the current administration has unwound what's called the Clean Power Plan. One of the primary factors in carbon emissions is the production of power, and trying to reduce the carbon emissions associated with that I think makes sense. Trying to reduce the emissions out of our tailpipes makes sense, and I think it's a shame that this administration has tried to wind that back uh, as well. So there are actions that we can take. Um, I actually think our governor put it very well. He said this is the first generation to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. All right, question here. Please. Following up on my previous question, um, I find it interesting that every time kind of the discussion of timber comes up, the debate always gets shifted to how much timber is available and do we need to cut more in the national forest centers. But my question is really, it's not that there's not enough timber available. When you look at how much, and you do the math and use the numbers that the port provides, there's a lot of logs that are just being exported. There's plenty of logs. Your okay, question? But we're not building them here. So what's the role of the government in keeping those logs here, milling them here, and not shipping them overseas? Both candidates? All right, we will start with Derek. I think there's probably a legal question. I mean, you asked about uh, prohibition on, on log exports. I think, you know, as I've talked to attorneys as, uh, who've, when, when this issue's been raised in the past, there's a concern that if there was such a prohibition put in place, it would represent a takings and wouldn't be constitutional. Part of the reason that uh, I discussed the role of the federal lands and our state lands is because there is, on our public lands, a prohibition on, on the exporting of those logs. And so working to increase the harvest levels in a responsible way off the federal lands does provide opportunities for our local mills. Douglas. Uh, I mean, I'm going to answer your question as directly as I humanly can. I don't think the government, the federal government, has any role at all in deciding where those logs go once they're cut. I think the federal government should try to make as much money off of those logs as they can to support the programs that they're supposed to pay for. It, what it requires us to do is say, how can we use those resources that are right in our backyard and, and make money off of that? There should be some way that we can step up and figure out how we can mill logs here and make money for our communities. I think in Shelton there's a mill there now. I think that they hired about 25% of people after they um, laid off almost everybody in the mill and then they modernized it and now there's only a quarter of the people there that used to be in the community but the jobs are higher wage jobs where people are actually making a living and I think we need to do that. We can't let the government artificially say we're going to have some standard of living because this is our log. We need to focus on making the money we can from the log and then having local ideas, local companies find out how to maximize the fact that that's in our backyard. The government, the government can't do that. The government doesn't know what to do with a log. The government doesn't know how to bring a log to the market that makes the most resources for the community, how many two by fours it can be turned into. That, that's, that's private industry, that's local people, that's the way it needs to be dealt with. I don't think the government should be saying there's a quota, uh, this is our resource, we need to maximize our profit from it, and then our communities can figure out how they can make it work for themselves. 
If, if the communities have to do that, they will do that. They did it in Shelton. Response, Derek? Um, this may be an area of disagreement, I guess, because uh, I support prohibiting the export of, of logs off of our federal lands. I think those logs should be available for local mills, for public benefit, for local jobs. Response, Douglas? I think it's fine. I think it's just an area of disagreement. I think it's, you know, it's people's job to figure out how they're going to make the most of the resource we have and, and protecting it that way doesn't make sense. We need to have the encouragement for people to figure out how we're going to maximize the logs, how we're going to use them the best. And we can raise to this challenge. We can do it. Shelton has done it. We just have to do it and not be protected and not be coddled by the, by the government. We have to step forward. We're smart. We're inventive. We can do what we need to do to keep the locks here because that's what makes the most money and makes the most sense for us. Are there any more questions? <laughs> well, there's one and two. All right. We'll do we'll do two more questions and then stop. Okay there have been times that you both have disagreed with one another. My first question was on how you would handle politics. So can you both talk to one another so that we can watch you and listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> and see um, how you would handle the disagreements you've yeah. had today. I'm guessing you took notes. Yeah. So maybe you can look through the notes and take it upon yourselves to pick one and talk about how you're going to work this out. Because that, this, is, um, this is what we did in school. Okay, I think they've got the idea. Um, and Douglas, it's your turn to start. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think there's any animosity. Right. Okay, fine. Here, we can do this. Right. I, I don't, I don't think there's any animosity between me and Derek. I, I, I don't feel it. I don't think it's there. I think that we actually have agreements. And, and we have disagreements. And I think the things that we disagree on are the reason we're here. So Derek has two wonderful daughters. He has a grandma that was very old. Um, and and I'm, I'm very glad that our society is here and supports his family. And I'm surprised, I'm not surprised, but I say surprised. I'm very glad that it supports my family too. But we just disagree on some of the ways that we should be moving forward. And that's okay, that's what this is about. Um, if we want to talk about the Seahawks, I'm happy to talk to the Seahawks. I, I mean, whatever subject you want, but, but this is part of the issue. This is, this is why we do this, because we don't agree on everything. And I, I, I don't feel compelled to actually reach a compromise on the issues that are important to each of us, because it's your job to choose what you feel best represents you. I think that was well put. Uh, and and I'll, I'll add, if uh, you were at our last debate, I offered to carpool with them here. Uh, you know, so, uh, here, here's what I will tell you. Um, our political system was not designed to have everybody agree on everything. That's not how it works. But we've got to get to a point um, as a society where we can uh, disagree without being disagreeable. I mean, listen, I had one of my colleagues got shot. Steve Scalise got shot. Gabby Giffords got shot. You know, we, we have got to dial down the level of toxicity in our political system. Um, uh, and beyond that, we have to actually figure out how to move forward on the things on which we agree, which is why I think people are genuinely frustrated with our current politics, because there's too many things where Democrats and Republicans actually agree with each other. And those are stuck in the garage, too, not able to uh, make it to the finish line. I've mentioned a couple times, I participate in this group called the Bipartisan Working Group, and it's kind of a meeting in three parts. The first part of the meeting, we go around the room, and anybody who's working on something where they want to invite collaboration or co-sponsorship, they get an opportunity to make a pitch. 
Second part of the meeting, we talk about what's going on in Congress that week. And those can get feisty, right? If you're talking about healthcare or immigration, right? Some of the issues we talked about tonight, people can get sharp elbows. But I'm increasingly of the belief that good democracy is a little bit like a good marriage. You know, you don't, des you don't necessarily agree with each other on everything, but you gotta be able to talk to each other and listen to each other and not impugn one another's motives and respect where you're coming from. And the third part of the meeting, we talk about big, hairy issues facing the country and how we might be able to find some common ground on those issues. Now, I don't want to mislead you into thinking we're sitting around the table holding the hands and singing kumbaya or closing our eyes and doing trust falls into each other's arms. Um, we stopped doing that after we dropped a guy. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, every time I walk out of that room, I find myself thinking, we got to do more of this as a country. We've got to be able to interact with one another, not just in our, you know, not just Folks who are running for office, all of us, need to be able to interact with each other. In the spirit of the question, do either of you have more to say to each other? <laughs> I'm just going to say that we need a, a change in the way Congress works. We have roles in Congress that are not constitutionally based, and we have a party that has absolute control. And we need to think about doing something where if 40% of the people in Congress are co-sponsoring co a bill, it gets voted on. It's not up to the Rules Committee to say, no, it doesn't get voted on. We're not even going to let it get through committee. Uh, we need to take that away because we're dangerously close to an oligarchy instead of a republic. And, and I know Derek has been really frustrated sometimes in his Washington, D.C. because he hasn't been able to get things acted on that are common sense that people would agree on and because of leadership and we need to we need to think about how are we going to change the leadership and i'm just going to leave it at that Derek. yeah I, I mentioned previously and i really do encourage everyone to look you can google it when you get home something called the break the gridlock package that is focused on trying to change the rules of congress to address some of these problems so that so that uh, uh, that the committees do what they were designed to do, which is actually to deliberate on bills and to amend bills and actually con consider these things in a more thoughtful way. Listen, Congress under the current uh, uh, approach is voting on stuff that never even got a hearing. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Um, there are bills that have bought broad bipartisan support that have never even gotten a vote. And I think that's where, you know, listen, it's weird. I haven't been doing this all that long. It's weird for me to be part of an organization that, according to recent polling, is less popular than the head lice, colonoscopies, and Justin Bieber. <laughs> um, and it's part of the reason I'm as committed as I am to trying to reform how Congress works and have a Congress that's working on behalf of the American people, not just participating in partisan bickering. Our last question. Thank you. Yeah. So, Dr. Deitman, it appears that you are in the camp of people who believe that there is not yet enough research to prove that anthropogenically accelerated climate change is a for sure thing. So, to your point, I would argue that I get quizzed on that very research here in this institution. It's in textbooks. But, in the absence of that research right now, would you, if elected, support legislation to specifically fund, separate from the National Science Foundation, the work of climate scientists to prove once and for all that anthropogenically accelerated climate change is real. Douglas. I'll, I'll prove to, I'll, I'll fund money to prove that it's either real or not real. I mean, you just restated that it's real. You're, you're not even being really honest with your question. Um, I said before that we need to get to the bottom of the issue. We need to figure out what the right answer is. So that's what I will do, um, and that's what I've said I'll do. You'll fund the research. I'll fund the research. There's no reason not to fund the research. The Republican Party and part of its platform says we shouldn't even be acknowledging this anymore. It's just simply wrong. Um, it, it's, if it's happening, it's a huge issue, and we need to know whether it's happening or not. Right now, it, the science in my mind, isn't there to convince me yet. And it's so, in a textbook right over there. well, you know, I can give you a hundred different textbooks for the one you give me. That's just a, that's just a silly thing to say. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Derek, you'd like to respond? I don't know that I have all that much more to add from what I said previously. I think climate change is real and I think it's time to take action. Um, I'm against defunding climate science. I'm against removing the words climate change from federal agency websites. Um, 
uh, you know, and I think, again, uh, we all should have a sense of urgency uh, on taking action on this. Uh, Douglas, you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say that, that, I mean, this is an important issue, but, but there's so much politics involved in this. I mean, the Democratic Party doesn't consider hydroelectric power renewable. I mean, there, there is, it's just, there's ridiculous stuff views on this on both sides. And so we need to open back up our minds, step away from the politics of this, and just take a really good look at it. Any more, Derek? No, I'm good. All right. Well, for such a small group, you were dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope that the, um, or I forget closing statements. <laughs> um, it's a, it's very nice that this is video because there's an opportunity for you to tell people and you both your candidates to tell people to go on the league website and watch the debate and get the full the information. All right. Well, you held up well. Um, and it's time for your closing statements. To end the panel, we'll uh, allow each candidate three minutes for a closing statement. <laughs> and, uh, we will reverse the order from the opening statement and begin with Douglas. Well, so I think that there's probably no one in this room with agrees agrees with everything I've said today, and there there never will be anybody that honestly agrees with everything someone else says because. We all have to look out for ourselves and our families and our loved ones first. That's the first thing that we do as human beings. The second thing we do is we reach out and we figure out what we think is best for the people around us. And that, that's what politics is all about. We have differences about what we think is best for the people around us. I think that the government should as much as possible not be making those decisions for people. We should let people at the lowest level do that. We should let people in towns do that, in counties do that. And so my biggest point of view is that we need to keep money from flowing to Washington, D.C. We need to bring money back to our local communities where we feel passionate about decisions and be able to do it here. I think we're just heading in the wrong direction. And the reason I'm running is because I want to represent the other point of view, the point of view that we go to Washington, D.C. for specific reasons, which is to protect our national defense and protect the free market and protect people's ability to participate in the free market. So we need strong education programs. We need fairness between men and women. Those are all very important things. But the bottom line is we need to take more personal responsibility for all of those things in our life and not depend on the federal government to do it for us. That includes education as well. We should, education is not a right. Um, it's something that we have to work hard and, and earn. And we should make it easy for people to do it when they decided it's the right thing for them to do. So there's a clear difference between me and Representative Kilmer. Um, I'm excited about receiving some of the people's votes in this room if you have the same vision. My vision is different, and I think it's time for something that's a little bit different. And if you're agreeing with me, that's great. Let's make some changes. Derek Kilmer. So um, uh, before we go, I'd like to say I look at this as a job. I look at a campaign kind of like a job interview process. So let me tell you why I hope you rehire me. Uh, first, um, it's one thing to talk about jobs. It's another to actually have a record of doing something about jobs. I'm, uh, I spent a decade working in economic development professionally, um, in part because I grew up here and saw what happened when we saw a downturn in our economy. When I served in the state legislature, I passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill that created 18,000 jobs in this state. And I'm proud of the fact that the Washington Economic Development Association recognized me three times for the leadership that I've shown on economic development issues. Um, as your congressman, I focused on jobs, uh, whether that be working on rural broadband or working on the Olympic Forest Collaborative or working to protect Fairchild Airport here in Port Angeles um, or working to help our small businesses. I've been all about jobs and I'm uh, proud of the fact that the National Retail Federation named me a hero of Main Street for my work in that regard. 
Uh, it's one thing to talk about our military families and our veterans. It's another to have a record of doing something on their behalf. Uh, I look at it as a solemn honor to serve more military veterans than almost any member of Congress. And I'm glad that uh, AMVETS gave me their Silver Helmet Award for my efforts on behalf of those who've served our country. I think if you serve this country, we ought to have your back. I'm proud of the fact that the U.S. Navy gave me their Distinguished Public Service Award for my work on behalf of military families. It's one thing to talk about bipartisanship, it's another to actually be bipartisan. I'm proud to be the co-chair of the Bipartisan Working Group and a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Um, according to GovTrack and the Luger Center, I'm one of the most bipartisan members of the U.S. House. But listen, don't take my word for it. You can check my references. Uh, I'm proud to be endorsed by folks all across the political spectrum, by groups like the Conservation Voters and the Labor Council. I'm proud that an article in the Washington Post named me as one of the five most effective Democrats in the U.S. House. I'm proud uh, to have been endorsed by the Tacoma News Tribune. Um, and when they endorsed me, though they called me both wonky and nerdy, which kind of hurt my feelings, um, <laughs> that they applauded my interest in fiscal responsibility and my efforts to work across the aisle. Listen, I'm not done working to get our economy on track. I'm not done working to get this Congress on track. And that's why I'm here to ask for your vote. I'm proud to have grown up here in Port Angeles. I'm very grateful for the support that I've gotten from this community. And I continue to ask for your support. Thanks, everybody. Before you all leave, I would like you to allow me to first thank our candidates and then a few remarks. Uh, so on behalf of the League of Women Voters and the Peninsula College Associated Students, we thank you for coming Thanks. and giving us this opportunity. A plug. Again. All right. Okay, firstly, are there any other, I don't, any candidates running for other offices in this group to introduce themselves? No? Okay. Um, I, uh, I want a special thanks to our timers. That was a big job tonight. You did great. <laughs> and the candidates did pretty good. Um, um, and thank you to the Student Council for being good partners. We'll be very happy to be here. Uh, for those, uh, remember to tell everyone about, they can see this, this forum on uh, the League website. Remember that Monday, October 29th is the last day to change your address or register in person at the Clallam County uh, Auditor's offices. Ballots were mailed today and your marked ballot must be placed in a drop box and a postmark no later than November 6th. Ballots now have prepaid postage, so you don't even need to buy a stamp. <laughs> Please uh, uh, remind your families, friends to cast their votes as well. Let's improve that turnout. Let's get well, well over 50%. Um, Let's try for 95%. 100%. Well, that too. That would be a good goal. <laughs> I also um, wanted to tell you the League of Women Voters of Washington has developed a new resource that will help you make ballot decisions. It's called vote411.org. It's nonpartisan online voter guide. Uh, all candidates have been encouraged to post their answers. I'm assuming these candidates have done that. Uh, on issues facing their local communities, you can pick up your vote411.org bookmark at the league membership table. And remember, there's copies of summaries of the four ballot initiatives if you would like more uh, information on them. Visit our membership table, pick up your bookmark, consider joining. It's open to everybody, men too. Um, donations are also welcome. Uh, that's what finances our ability to continue to offer these forums. That's it, vote, thank you, and have a good night. Oh,